Welcome everyone to Comics from the Multiverse episode 382. I am Peter and joining me once again into this journey beyond is Matt. Beyond what? Are we are we going into the bleed? What are we doing? Oh, uh, you make a sly reference to one of the books from later on now. Is that yeah, what you're yeah. doing? M- maybe. Uh, yes. Welcome everyone. This is a DC Comics podcast. Uh, we get together and talk about the books we read this week. Coming up on this week's show, we have Detective Comics 1077, Batman and Robin issue 3, Green Lantern issue 5, World's Finest Teen Titans issue 5, Speed Force issue 1, Outsiders issue 1, Wesley Dodds the Sandman issue 2, The Vigil issue 6, and Danger Street issue 11. So it's a packed week, uh, which is annoying because last week had like three or four books. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Just spread them out, DC, that's all I ask. Yeah. Yeah, please. But uh, yeah, that is what's coming up on the show. We also have solicits for February, so we got a whole host of things to talk about. Uh, but that's okay. But I, uh, I, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's rumors of buzz for the Superman movie about what's going on. I won't say what uh, mm-hmm. the spoilers or rumors are because mm-hmm. people may want to stay away from that. But yeah, it seems like you know now that the strikes are all over, it feels like things are starting to ramp up. Guns mm-hmm. adamant that they're keeping the release date. I don't know if I believe him still, but we'll see. Yeah, that was kind of funny that he, you know, they they did that big ad. Right for social media, uh, with the Superman font. Uh, but yeah, we'll we'll see. He is he is a skilled technician, I guess. Like he came out of the Marvel system, so I, I do think he might be able to keep it. But we'll see. <laughs> I don't know if I want anything to remind me of the way Marvel makes movies <laughs> and anything I watch. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, thank yeah, you very yeah, much. Have to look. Did you see Guardians three yet? I did. I saw Guardians okay. three. I mean, easily the best of this batch it's been out, but, you know, he was rolling them out quick, right? Um, the only, I think the only delay for Guardians 3, right, was because he got fired when he made Suicide Squad and then got rehired. Or else yeah. I feel like Guardians 3 might have been out earlier, so... Oh, yeah, no doubt. Yeah. That, that said, though, yeah. he didn't get hired after he was from... He, like, he got rehired very early mm-hmm. on, uh, yeah. so he knew he was going to go and do Guardians 3 for a lot of Suicide Squad, but... Yeah, mm-hmm. obviously that Marvel had made their bed and gone and went yeah. off and got engaged to DC Comics seemingly in the meantime. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Uh, yeah, I I don't know if there was much other news uh, to really talk about other than the fact that we got solicits, but the solicits are always pretty full. Um, mm-hmm. There was a little bit of drama about the upcoming Wonder Woman video game this week, but nothing. Uh, well, I, I, explain that one to me. What, well, what's the drama? There was a job listing for the developer who's making the game, and uh-huh. it said one of the things they were looking for in an applicant was experience working on a live service game, which you probably don't know what that means, Matt, but most video game players despise live service games <laughs> uh, and do not want their games to be live service. It's one of the many things that people are not happy about with the new Suicide Squad game that's coming out uh, mm, so next year. That was my next question, because I, I listened to a show with Samoa Joe, on it this week Mm. um and he was talking about how suicide squad got delayed um so because he's the voice of king shark yeah in the game so um but yes Uh, that reminded me that that game was coming out still yeah uh not a lot of hype for it it's because it's made Mm -hmm. from the people who did all the batman games but it doesn't play anything like a batman game it plays i mean you've got king shark and captain boomerang but they're all firing guns so right. it just feels like they're. I don't know. It feels. It feels very generic, but just DC character skins kind of on top. So is that is that like Destiny and Fortnite? Are those live server? Those those are live service games. Yeah. 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 Live service. They come in slightly uh, different flavors, but the, the yeah. idea is, is that you're you're paying for season passes and skins right. and and things like that, rather than it being like a a full experience that you do from start to end and your finished credits roll right. and you know right. but, it's not so much storytelling it's you know it's almost yeah. like sport in that yeah you know like I mean, you're going to play pickup games some of these games technically have stories like destiny does have mm-hmm. lore but when i tried playing it hell if i could follow any of it it yeah. was such a mess but uh so yeah basically everyone was like oh no and this seems like the, the par for the course with warner brothers games uh but what's actually i really liked about this is that just today or maybe it was yesterday um someone from warner brothers came out uh to deny that it was a live service game 
Mm -hmm. And what I like about that is that the phrase life service has become such a dirty word that now a company, once this rumor was out there that it was going to be a live service game, they felt the need to squash it. And the fact that some video game developers are getting that message that it's something that mm -hmm. has to be squashed because it's like a black mark on your on your game. Because the thing with Suicide Squad is as soon as they showed it to people last year, everyone collectively just went, oh, we don't want this. Yeah. There was a collective groan, I remember. So, yeah. So maybe the Wonder Woman game will be good. I mean, I still think it may end up being a very generic open world game. We'll see. But, I mean, uh, yeah, it's not live service. Is it possible, you know, because, again, I'm a, um, I don't know much about video games, but is it possible to have a live service element to the game, or is it, like, all or nothing? It can, it can be a little. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. Uh, I know something like fighting games tend to get away with it now where it'll still be the core fighting game you expect mm -hmm. but there'll be like live service elements in like a certain mode or two where they can still sell people stuff and, and things like that gotcha. um it, but yeah it, it, those team these, those seem to be fewer and further between um mm -hmm. but it's a uh, it's it's all about nickel and diming people and try to keep people yeah. spending money the entire time uh which is how most people don't consume their games that way. I, there was a big push to do a lot of live service games over the last few years, which is why Suicide Squad is the way it is. Right. It's what the Avengers game was. It's what right. um, some other games have tried to be. And what's actually happened, because all these developers rushed to do it because they saw how much money Fortnite was making, right. how much money a couple of them were making. But what they've realized is is that the pool of people who want to play games like that is, is finite. And right. once they're locked into one of those games... They don't want to leave that and start another one. They want to keep going in the one that they've already spent money in and that they've already accumulated their stats in and, and whatnot. So what they've found is, is that a lot of these ones that have tried to launch, like Avengers, which you would think would be bulletproof because it's the Avengers brand, mm -hmm. they shut down the servers for that uh, this yeah. year. It's gone. You can't play most of it anymore. You can't even buy it anymore. It's been delisted soon. Uh so that's so crazy yeah the game's dead because right, because i i come from right like the cartridge generation right to where as long as as long as your cartridge still worked and as long as the system still worked you could keep playing it you know uh i believe you can still play the single player campaign in avengers but you can, yeah but they still delisted the game though and i think it's because right. they realized that so much of what they were trying to sell people with that game was all the mm -hmm. live service stuff that they, they don't think right. it's worth having around for just a single player story so right that's it it's gone uh so crazy it feels like they're all going oh wait a minute maybe this wasn't the the magical cash cow that we all thought it was and yeah. we're, we're kind of because even the biggest ones that are still very successful are kind of declining and yeah they, they don't like that they like infinite growth that's what they always want uh, like yeah. Fortnite's company, Epic, they just laid off like 500 people, uh, and they're making absurd amounts of money. But they're not making as much money as they were this time last year. So mm -hmm. they started firing people, and that feels w weird and yeah, you know, just greedy and whatnot. But yeah. Anywho, uh, they also say there's hope for the Wonder Woman game yet, and uh, life service. So, what sucks. would you want in a Wonder Woman game? Uh, that's a good question. I think I'm just sick in general of like most open worlds because they tend to be very similar. Now, admittedly, mm -hmm. Spider-Man works and gets away with it because he has such a unique way of moving around that yeah. you always find yourself having fun going around it. But so many open world games are you've got a map, you've got a checklist of different things that you can find and you go around and blah, blah, blah. Uh, a lot of Ubisoft games are like that. And I, I don't tend to like those. Mm -hmm. um so i would rather it wasn't open world but even if it is i think the key thing is making the combat fun is incorporating the lasso and the shield mm -hmm. into the combat in a way that feels good i think people were saying you effectively make like the modern god of war game but with wonder yeah. woman and use her you know her weapons instead of like instead of an axe and a you know right. set of chains That's you're using so the lasso right. and yeah. whatnot and i'm like yeah okay that sounds interesting it sounds fun mm. um but yeah, I don't know. I, I guess just have a good story. Uh, don't be bloated. So, so many mm -hmm. games these days are too long. Like they, they, they feel the need to like justify the $70 price point. So they, yeah. a game that should be 15 hours becomes 30 hours, and it's like, oh. <laughs> now, so. how long was the first Spider-Man game? 
Uh, for if you were just mainlining the story, you could probably do it in twelve to fifteen hours. If you were hundred okay. percent in it and doing all the side stuff, yeah. that that'd get you up to about twenty five. Uh, okay. The second game's about the same. Okay. Give or take. Because so. that's about the length of a, a game that I can keep my attention on. You know, something yeah, along, I, along those lines. Thirty to forty hours, sixty in extreme cases for an RPG, I, I mm-hmm. can be okay with. But for something that is um, more action focused, I I feel like yeah, that twelve to fifteen hour sweet spots where I like it to be. Typically, mm-hmm. uh, there's exceptions, obviously, but that's mm-hmm. uh, that's where it is. Yeah. So, oh well. Uh, but hey, yeah, I, I, I didn't even know they were doing a one Roman game. So this uh, is all news. They Pretty announced news to me. Yeah, they announced it ages ago in like a little teaser trailer, and then it's been quiet since. But it's just a few these past few months. There's been these little things like like a a, a bit of art for it leaked a few mm-hmm. months ago, and then this job listing thing this past week. So there's just been these little tidbits that are uh, sort of coming out. But mm-hmm. uh, I don't know. We'll we'll see how it goes. I mean, there's a lot of superhero games in the works right now. Uh, there's both Iron Man and Black Panther games in the works. There's mm. Uh, I'm sure there was something else I'm forgetting. Is there a Justice League game in the works? I don't know. I think there, I think there was rumors of one. Man, how would an Iron Man game play like? I mean, like what, corporate corporate stuff? Like you're, you're doing <laughs> no. Actually, espionage? what's funny about this is it's actually very easy to think about how an Iron Man game might play, at least parts of it, because mm-hmm. uh, if you're if you're seeing Dead Space... In that okay. game, you go into zero gravity at times, and you've got like thrusters on your boots, so you're actually kind of flying around like Iron Man sometimes. In that, I feel like you just okay. make that faster, and you have a lot more projectile weapons from your hands and yeah. shit. I, I honestly, Iron Man's a lot easier, I think, to make a game out of than a lot yeah. of the other characters. I would say. Yeah, I'm just wondering what that would be like because I don't like the reason I went about Spider Man is I saw Into the Spider Verse, right, and I was like, oh, I want to go do that. I don't watch Iron Man in, in the Avengers movies and be like, well, that would be fun to do. Just go blast people with repulsor rays and stuff. <laughs> you know, like Superman, I get. I mean, but also I'm a mark for Superman. Um, although that said, there hasn't really ever I feel been like a good s- Superman game. You, you say so. this, but I feel like Superman and Iron Man would play relatively similar. They both oh. fly around. They both have uh, laser yeah, beams they like, can fire. The, the one thing with Superman, I always thought, like, you can't give Superman a life meter until, like, a boss battle, battle right? You just, it would have to be, like, the city, right? So if the city's taking destruction, that's that's where, you know, that would type of stuff would come in. So it would be kind of an open world type thing where you're going around, putting up fires, and then, the you know, the, the, the story kicks in and stuff. Just with Iron Man, I don't know. It also just shows my... Not distaste of Iron Man, but I don't yeah, know. Iron Man's the easiest because he's got lots of different weapons you could upgrade. Like he, he sort of lends himself <sighs> to video games really easily. Yeah, well, see, that's why you're the video game guy, and I'm not, <laughs> right? Like the problem with Superman know. is you can't like justify like upgrades because right. he's just got all these abilities, nothing upgrades. Right. Uh, right. So, although you could do a thing like they did in the first uh, in uh, Fallen Order, where he you unlock things as you go. You know, build a story mechanism that Clark doesn't. Sure, have I mean, maybe if you do like control. a t- maybe if you do like an early days Superman, you could sort of yeah. say, "Oh, he's only just getting this power kicking in now," kind of thing. Right. But right, uh, you know, I don't know. Like Superman's See, always been touted as one of the tougher characters yeah. to make a good game out of because mm-hmm. it's so vast. It's like, okay, yeah, you can build an open world city like Spider Man, and yeah, when I'm gliding about in Spider Man too, I'm thinking, "Oh, this feels like it could be a Superman game almost." Like mm-hmm. I can see myself flying around. But the problem is with Superman is that I feel like I shouldn't be confined to one city. I should be able to fly all the way over to, you know, Europe yeah. from Metropolis. Yeah. Just just to go grab some cheese fries, you know? <laughs> basically, basically, you want Microsoft Flight Simulator, but instead of a plane, it's just Superman. <laughs> uh, Kryptonian Flight Simulator. And occasionally there's giant things to fire your heat vision yeah. at. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, fun times. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, anywho, sh- shall we do the common soldier top ten, Matt? You, you like, yeah, you like, let's do this. As as we're talking, I was looking through my covers of the week, so this will get my focus back on one thing. Oh, you're getting an early, but I haven't even looked at the covers for this week yet. Mm-hmm. But we can look at the common soldier top ten. 
Uh, so we'll look at Tuesday first because they're separated by days. So as of right now, Matt, what do you think the number one book from DC is on Comicsology? Um, I want to say Detective Comics. That hasn't been selling that well. So I'm going to say Batman and Robin. That is incorrect. Dang. I'll be honest, this is a surprising. Oh, it's surprising. Okay. Yeah, I would say it's surprising. Is it a number one? It is a number one. All right, so that, that limits. I'll go Outsiders. It is Outsiders. Boom. That's surprising, uh, though, right? I wouldn't have thought it, that. No, it is, because I wasn't, like, I forgot that book came out until I got to the shop. Right? Yeah, yeah. Saw it was, there. And it was, I was kind like, of, like, I knew about it from Solicits and stuff, mm-hmm. but it was kind of on the periphery of my, Yeah, you know, I wasn't really, like, hyped for it or anticipating mm-hmm. it. It was just, like, guess there. I'll give it a try. Yeah. So, like, I just totally spaced on it. So, yeah, no, that is surprising. I mean, good good for that creative team. Like, that's that's great, debuting at one. Yeah. Uh, well, in comicsology, unfortunately, the industry is not... Uh, yeah, but still, I mean, that's still holds some cachet, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, number two is Batman and Robin. Number three is okay. Green Lantern. Number four is World's Finest Teen Titans. That Mark Wade name still doing some, some work. Mm-hmm. Uh, five is Superman Lost, which... Fair enough. I mean, I mm-hmm. like. I'm sad because I don't really like the book that much, but I, I guess it's all right that Superman's doing all right. Mm-hmm. Uh, six is Detective Comics. Seven is Wesley Dodd Sandman. Eight is Speed Force. Nine mm-hmm. is Danger Street. And ten is Wildcats. So uh, that is the top ten. Vigil just outside of that, and then you get into the collections and stuff, uh, which yeah. is not a lot of this week, but yeah, uh, that's that's pretty much it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, very heavy week for DC books, as uh, uh, you know, as we can attest to with all the mm-hmm. books we'll be talking about later. Uh, but we will have a quick look at Wednesday and the rest of the industry. So, what do you think that the number one book as of right now on Comicsology is? I'm looking for my cheat because I'm so out on Marvel and stuff that I don't pay attention at the shop of what comes out. Mm-hmm. But I'm seeing a new number one, so I'm gonna say Superior Spider-Man number one. Uh, no. no. No, okay. Um, is it Dark of, Dark X-Men? Nope. Okay, wow. Uncanny Avengers? It is Uncanny Avengers. Okay, there we go. Yeah, that's number Just one. My way down. So I was working my way down the line from Spider-Man to X-Men to Avengers. That's, <laughs> that's you know, uh, the priority list at, at Marvel. Yeah, number two is Jean Grey. So still in the X realm. Uh, yeah. And then we have number three is Big Game Issue 5. That's the Mark Miller book. Mark Miller uh, book, so, yeah. so not Marvel. That's something. Uh, four is Dark X-Men. Five is Immortal Thor. Six is Children of the Vault, which is an X-Men yes. thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, seven is Suspiria, yeah, Suspiria Spider-Man. That's a very different type of Spider-Man. Superior I don't even Spider-Man. want to watch that Spider-Man movie. <laughs> A lot of dancing. Yeah, I'll just have a lot of pretty color. Well, actually, are you thinking of the remake or the original? Yeah. Either the remake. I went, I went for the remake of the uh, for the joke. Yeah. Uh, yes. Never has eroticism been so bleak looking. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. Uh, uh, number eight is G.I. Joe. Fair enough. <laughs> number nine yeah, is yeah. Alpha Flight. And number 10 is Astonishing Iceman. So there you go. Uh daredevil just not quite cracking the top 10 at 11 uh so yeah very good um yeah looking a little bit further down there's a new alien mini started this week alien issue one by declan shelvey uh did they do the last one as well i feel like they might have done that that, might maybe i feel like they did the last mini, but that's yeah whatever um yeah okay not much that that's all there's a lot of marvel books out this week jesus yeah i'm I'm down to number 30 and there's still marvel books sprinkled in all right but there you go Comicsology top ten for the week. Yeah, it's Declan Shelby and Andrea Procardo. So, yeah. So uh-huh. next and greatest story. Yeah. So this must be you know the second part of their thing. Yeah, so it's a sequel to the previous mm-hmm. money. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, interesting enough. Cool. Uh, part of me thinking why not just call this issue five if the last one was four issues, but whatever. <sighs> you know, they love an yeah. issue one. They love to try and wrangle new people in 
Which I feel like it's just I feel like it's just a disservice though if it is a sequel and like, oh this doesn't work as well if you've not read the previous mini. So it might as well yeah. have just been the next well, issue wait, in a series. I remember when they did that with the Brubaker cat books and I was trying to go and get caught up with Winter Soldier. They would renumber them and so there was like two cap two Brubaker Captain America volume ones. Yeah. Yeah. So, and it was very annoying instead of just like just call the next one, you know book three, book four. You know what I mean? Like uh, we've complained so, yeah. many a times about how Marvel, especially, love to make it more confusing than it needs to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, well, let's get to the solicits then. So this is the solicits for February, twenty twenty four. Which you know, I feel like I'm talking about a year from a science fiction movie. It's still, it's still not really settled Bro, in that I we're in the twenty twenties. I don't like it. I was paying my mortgage the other day, and I saw when the when the loan ends, and it is a future like date, like. It's like 2049. <laughs> <laughs> like, That's a Blade just, Runner like, movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and with the new sphere, 2049 is going to look wild when we get there. Uh, uh, there'll be more, maybe there'll be two spheres and they can be big oh boobs. God. Okay. Just in the middle of Vegas. Two big lose, lose twice the amount of money. That'll be great. <laughs> Hey, they'll make it back, back up from tickets in about the yeah. next 30 years. <laughs> sure. I think it's funny that uh, I guess one of the reasons that it hasn't been doing well is the ads, like to, to get your ad on the sphere, it's like astronomical. And then I was like, I haven't seen any ads on there except for stuff that's coming to the sphere. So, you know, how hmm. much is astronomical? What are we looking at? I, um, well, I expect it would be astronomical. I know there's been yeah. some ads because there was an Xbox one where they had the Xbox okay. logo kind of like open up and whatnot, but okay. it must be the sort of thing where you've got two problems with it. You've got, number one, mm. it costs an absurd amount. Where, I mean, I don't know if it's like Super yeah. Bowl money, but it wouldn't surprise me if it is. Yeah. Uh, and then two is that the resolution of that thing is so huge that they have to make this like huge quality ad for it. Yeah. They can't just yeah. slap on what they've got on the website, you know? It's like, yeah. You, you need sure. to make a, a big version of it. Some 16K Again, monstrosity. At, at night, I can sometimes make out words on that. <laughs> and I, I live pretty far from it. So, yeah, I mean, oh, it's crazy, crazy times. Yeah, I was hearing this week that people who live nearer it are complaining <laughs> because it's too bright to get to sleep. And, yep. I mean, I don't want to be a dick, but you live in Las Vegas, right? <laughs> There's a lot of lights. Yeah, but there are, you know, there there is a bright side of Vegas and a dark side of Vegas because they both face each other, right? Mm. Like, and the sphere is off of that. So, like, there were houses there already, you know, and old uh, apartments and all this stuff. It's the same with the F1 right now with, with that monstrosity ruining things. Um, the people that live over there that have lived there for years aren't being able to go home because the one of the streets that leads to their house is part of the course. That's bullshit. Yeah, and so it's a it's a whole. They have to. It's taking them, you know, two hours to get home when normally it would take five minutes. You know, it's just it's a whole wild thing. Um, I'm not enjoying it. And granted, I'm I'm not doing anything tonight. The F1 race is tonight. I'm staying at home and watching wrestling and ordering food. It, I'm not going out on the streets because from everything I've heard, it's going to be a nightmare. Um, so yeah. All right. Well, February solicits then for 2023. We'll get into it. And you know, first thing here is you know how we've not been loving Zarsky's Batman run? They thought they'd be really nice to us and give us three issues of it in February. They're so, you know, they're so thoughtful. <laughs> hey, but the, the two good names for art here. So I might be, I might be salty, but there's a little bit of sweetness with that. Uh oh, uh, Sorrentino. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah. Sorrentino and Cammy and Coley. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So they're doing this whole Joker Year One, uh, thing, which is probably tied into Batman looking into this three Jokers business. But uh, so we've, we've got Joker holding like a red hood, uh, like dome on the cover of yeah. uh, issue one forty two, uh, one forty three, and one forty four are also solicited for February. You remember on, on uh, Arrested Development with Carl Weathers? Mm-hmm. I think it was from that. Is that where not interested comes from? Or is that from another thing he did? There, there, was, a famous, there was a famous sound clip of I, Carl I, I thought going, you were about to hit me with that's yeah. how you get a stew going. Because I remember him saying that a lot on yeah, the show. Yeah. No, it was, it was not interested. Uh, and that, that's how I feel about Joker Year One. 
Yeah. Uh, You're going to read it anyway, though, Matt, because it'll be too interesting not to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, no, I know. It's, this is what happens <laughs> is I worked myself into a corner doing a, a show that now I can't. Stuff I normally wouldn't want to read, I get bullied into reading by by you and by our, our listeners. Oh, only so. one or two things a month. It's not like that much. Come on, yeah. now. You get to drop a lot. No, that's true. But one of them is Batman that I'm really not enjoying, and I just have to keep going. <laughs> Uh, uh, okay, next up we have Suicide Squad Kill Arkham Asylum issue one. I suspect this is tying into the the game since that Suicide Squad killed the Justice League. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking. It says yeah something to do with DC Universe Infinite Annual. Well, it says know. before Suicide Squad sets sights on the corrupted Justice League in the upcoming video okay. game. So, uh, there it is at the front. Yeah, so. I, I was looking at the bottom where it said, so sustained subscribers of the DC Universe Infinite Annual or Ultra subscription <laughs> who read the digital issues of Suicide Squad will also receive bonus digital codes. So uh, they're really going mm. out of their way for this one. And it's John Lehman, though. Like, I know it's a, it's a tie-in to the game, but Lehman was a, a, a name uh, that I enjoyed years ago. It's been a while. Hmm. Yeah. The only video game tie-in comic I've ever read was the Arkham City one, mm. which was... Yeah, around when I was starting to read single issues, which is probably why I bought it, because it just seemed like an easy thing to read. Mm-hmm. Uh, next up, we got a new series uh, called Sinister Sons from Peter J. Tomasi and David Lafayette. This is basically an evil take on Super Sons. It's Sinestro's kid and Zod's kid teaming up as an evil pair of Super Sons. Okay. Oh. Monkey paw. I miss Tomasi and Super Sons. Uh-huh. Monkey Paw goes down. You get Tomasi and Sinister Sons. Uh. I, I think th- I like the novelty of this concept, mm-hmm. but the backup setting this up that's in one of the books, I, well, I didn't really like the first one and I didn't even bother yeah. reading the second one this week because I had so many books yeah. to read. So You made the right decision. I read it just to be like, oh, maybe it'll pick up in the back half. I was wrong. Yeah, yeah. So I can't say I'm particularly excited for this. Uh, but hey, it's the thing. It exists. It's cute that mm-hmm. it exists, but I don't think I, I care do. That much. I do like that the cover seems to be aping the uh, original Super Sons cover. Yeah. So that'll be intentional for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so very good. Uh, then we have Justice League versus Godzilla versus Kong issue five. Uh, that is a great cover. So that'll be coming. Oh, yeah, it's Godzilla's reflection on the Hall of Justice. Uh-huh. Uh, well, the Godzilla TV show just started uh, yesterday. I know. I know. I'm, I'm letting you get some episodes in and uh, <laughs> uh, before I go at it, which I did. I also started Chucky, so... Oh, nice. Um, yeah, so I'm going to get back on that train tomorrow, but yeah. Uh, but yeah. You know, it's obviously it's more about the humans than it is about the monsters, but mm-hmm. I will say the twenty seconds where you see monsters, like they look <laughs> just like the movies, like the the That's effects, good. you know. Uh, uh, it's not bad though. First two episodes, not bad. Yeah, no. Uh, Jared, one of my buddies, let me know that he started it with his kid last night because his kid's a big Godzilla nerd, mm. um, and he's like, "Oh, wasn't expecting it to be about the humans as much, or you know, waiting for Kurt Russell to show up." So don't worry, uh, he's there by the end of episode two. Okay, good. Good, good, good. Yeah. But you do get his son doing his best yep. Kurt Russell because he's meant to be the younger version of the same right. character. Yeah. Well, and I like I like Wyatt enough, so that, that's good for me. Hmm. All right, so that's cool. Uh, we got Batman Off World issue four, which mm-hmm. we know is coming soon because uh, all the books this week were uh, spamming ads yep. at me for it. Yeah, yeah, coming out next week actually. So. Uh, oh well, we'll find out soon how we feel about it mm-hmm. then, won't we? Uh, Batman and Robin issue six solicited. Uh, so that's still going. Batman Brave and the Bold, issue 10. Uh, who have we got on this one? Carl... Carl? Kershaw. Kershaw, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, Torin... Ronbrack? You can't tell me that's not a name from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> uh, we have Delilah S. Dawson and Dan Waters. Dan Waters is the only name here that I yeah. <laughs> recognize out of those writers. So... Hey, I don't know. Uh, we'll see. Uh, we got Detective Comics 1082. Ram V still going strong. Mm-hmm. We got art by Federici in this issue, so that's yeah. uh, something to be excited about. And, and Stefano Raffaelli. So that's yeah. good too. Uh, Nightwing 111. Uh, also a nice cover. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. I've been digging these like simplistic covers where it's just blue, black, and white on these yeah. uh, Nightwing covers. But uh, So that's coming in February. 
We got Birds of Prey issue 6, which I imagine is coming around the end of that first arc, I imagine. Just yeah, and Leonardo Fernandez on art on this issue, so maybe this is like a in-between. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, this description looks like it's deep into the arc, uh, so yeah. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's just uh, he's the other artist on the book, I yeah. guess. Could be. Uh, Outsiders issue 4, obviously we'll talk about this uh, later because mm-hmm. issue 1 just came out today, or this week, but uh, mm. yeah, so that's still going. Uh, Catwoman issue 62... Not much to say there. Penguin issue mm-hmm. seven. King's book still going strong. Harley Quinn thirty seven. Poison Ivy nineteen. Wesley Dodds the Sandman issue five. Jay Garrick the Flash issue five. Alan Scott Green Lantern issue five. All, all these Golden Age characters. Ooh, what's this? Uh, and then we get to Red Hood the Hill issue zero, which is from Sean Martin Burrow and uh, art by Tony Atkins and Morita. And this is. Uh, it's 48 pages, so it doesn't say one shot. So I'm not sure if it is, but it sounds like a one shot. Uh, no, it's a, a collection. Oh, it's a collection. Oh. Yep. Redhead Outlaw 51 and 52. Oh, so Connor's so, already read them now. So yes. That's, that's a shame. You'll have to let us know. That's a shame. Uh, okay, fair enough. Um, Wait, wasn't the hill where the Bat Girls lived? It was, yeah. That was okay. their area, yeah. Okay. Speaking of uh, sure. Yeah, but they are releasing that with a purpose because Red Hood, the Hell issue one, is mm-hmm. out. It's on a six issue miniseries uh, by the same writer, but with Sanford Green on art. So, so a... as much, yeah, as much as I kind of roll my eyes at this, Sanford Green on art makes me curious enough to check it out. Hmm. You heard it here, everyone. He just came at you to this issue one. I'll, I'll at least one issue. It comes out in in February. I'll probably forget about it and get mad at myself. <laughs> As always happens. <laughs> hey, me gets it's out the 13th. Me. This is a Valentine's treat yes. to yourself. Yeah, you know what it is. It's Valentine's Day. to be, no wife, I will not partake in romantic moments. I have to read Red Hood. <laughs> and you know, what, you know what happens to me when I read Red Hood? It makes me very angry. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, you, you may say, well, I mean, what is the description of this? Welcome to the Hell, formerly one of Gotham's most dangerous suburbs, a place that required its residents to band together to keep themselves safe when the police, and sometimes even Batman, wouldn't. Now, as the Hell finds itself gentrifying, old habits die hard, as the vigilante, known only as Strike, works her team to keep the town safe. But she's not alone. Jason Todd, one of the Hell's newest residents, uh, and I'll just, you know, that'll do. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think, um... It feels weird too that it's not acknowledging that the Batgirls have been keeping the hill yeah. safe for a while. And that, that's why I have that question because mm. if it really was one of the most dangerous places, you know, then why isn't he running into the Batgirls? Because I can't imagine they moved out. Yeah, very strange. Uh, I mean, I do like that they're keeping the hill as an area of Gotham, like a, mm-hmm. a, a consistent thing that we can talk about. Yeah. Just like we have the Narrows, we have, you know, different parts we can talk about. I like building the cities mm-hmm. up like that, but sure. uh, that's a bit weird. Uh, we got Action Comics 1062. This is Jason Aaron and John Timms. And I'm actually just kind of sad because it, John's, it's not a... Uh... Yeah, but then, you know, I we're training for a Jason Aaron Bizarro story, which has me very excited. I'd still rather have Philip Johnson, but I mean... <sighs> yeah, I know. But like, Bizarro, Jason Aaron. Uh, did you ever read his Wolverine and the X-Men? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm hoping that's what the tone is, is I, I read uh, all of that, I think. Or at least most yeah. of it, if I didn't. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, we got Superman issue 11. Uh, David Baldian mm-hmm. on the art on this one with Williamson. So, very good. Very uh, busy cover. It is indeed. We have Neil Before Zod issue 2. I forgot this existed, but this is uh, the new series coming out. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got Batman Superman World's Finest issue 24. We got mm-hmm. Power Girl issue 6. We got mm-hmm. Fire and Ice, Welcome to Smallville, issue 6, which is the final issue of this book. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got Wonder Woman, issue 6, and yes, of course, why not just have another fantastic cover that you could put in the wall as a poster, because this book just seems to get those Good consistently. Lord. Just ridiculous, right? Like... Yeah, it's just... It's just uh, King, uh, we keep saying this, but King's got blackmail uh, yeah. material on someone. He worked for the CIA. We'd be stupid to believe that he doesn't. <laughs> uh, we got Amazon's Attack issue five, and we were quite positive on that first yeah. issue. So uh, I'm actually invested in when this pops yeah. up now. 
So uh, that's cool. You got Peacemaker on the cover with the the uh, name. the the team in sight. They don't really have a name, I guess, just the Amazons. But yeah, but Mary Marvel's there. I wouldn't really count her as an Amazon, but whatever. no, but she gets her powers from uh, Amazonian sure. goddesses. Sure. So, oh sure. Uh, yep. Are you just watching the hockey when you look off to the side? N- no. <laughs> you son of a bitch. <laughs> I thought, I thought Marchie just scored. He didn't. They were just saying that when he does score on the power play, they didn't win. So. I, I hope your team loses. I hope they lose so bad. Don't say that. It's tied 3-3 three, three in the third. Oh, All right, don't do that. They're going to lose, little bitches. This was going to happen. Uh, Who are they playing against? Uh, against uh, the Flyers, Philadelphia's team. Who I, who I have a lot of fondness for, just not today. Yeah, all of a sudden, I'm a big Philly fan. That's, that's weird. Yeah. That's weird how yeah. that works. Uh, Pete <laughs> just starts yelling, go birds. Uh, even though that's the football team. <laughs> uh, all right, Flash Issue 6 is next up on the list. Uh, uh, with a, a very horrifying looking cover. You got like a bunch yeah. of aliens sort of grabbing at Flash. It's very zombie-esque. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, very cool. Uh, Make the Odo Jr. still in the art in this one, along with Trish uh, Mulvhill. And uh, then we got Straight... Sorry, Straight Force. Speed Force <laughs> issue four. Uh, That's a different book. Yes. So we'll talk about issue one of that later, of course, because that came out this week. Uh, we have Titans issue eight coming out. Very mm-hmm. good. Steven Segovia on the art in that issue. Uh, we have Green Lantern issue eight with a very nice cover by Steve Beach. He's been doing the action covers recently. Yeah. And I can't help but notice that my boy Kyle is on the yes. cover of this one. So, uh... He is. Him in a stupid mask. Kellogg's also there, which I'm also happy yes. to see. Uh, yeah. But uh, I am delighted for, for this. Uh, I, I love Steve Beach's art, but uh, Hal has the biggest stank face I've ever seen. <laughs> he looks very pissed off. Yes, it's very yeah. true. Like... <laughs> Uh, hard to deny that but it's still very pretty uh, from an yes. art point of view it's just really nice uh, there's a big clock behind him as well I wonder if mm-hmm. we'll get some not time travel but like some you know maybe something time related going on yeah. uh, we got Green Lantern War Journal issue 6 which is cool because now that Johnson's off action I'm happy that he's got another mm-hmm. ongoing book I just I hope he ends up in something else soon so he's got yeah. something a- alongside this book but I am excited for more War Journal uh, we have Green Arrow issue 9. Uh, Waller's shaking hands with Green Arrow on the cover. As the Hall of Justice is seemingly burning behind them. Uh, I didn't read the last issue, Matt. I don't know if I'm going to go back and do it. <laughs> you, you don't have to. I'll keep reading it. Yeah. Oh. Uh, see, this is what I do, guys. Y'all, y'all guilt me into reading Batman, but then I'm still reading Green Arrow. So you're welcome. <laughs> uh, Shazam issue 8. Uh, up next, we got oh, Goran. No, he's surrounded by T Rexes. <laughs> he is. Well, I mean, we know that he's got a debt to pay to some T Rexes. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. So we know that's coming. Yeah, we got Goran uh, Suzuka on the art in this one. I don't know that name, uh-huh. so no idea if that's good mm-hmm. or not. But uh, well, we'll find out. Uh, oh. So cool. Uh, we got Blue Beetle issue six, which you've caught up on and have been enjoying. So yep. Uh, good to see. Same team on that, per usual. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got Batman 89 Echoes issue three with uh, someone's went into painstaking lens to make an almost photo real looking Catwoman from that movie on this yep. cover. Got Michelle Pfeiffer. <laughs> Pfeiffer. That's that's not even my joke. That's uh, that's a key and peel. Is it? When okay. the two valets are talking about Batman, and they talk about you know Michelle Pfeiffer in the in the leather. Oh, it's so funny. And now we got Superman seventy eight, the Metal Curtain issue four, and this has got Gene Hackman, Lex Luthor, uh, slipping uh, away. Not nearly as photorealistic. No, but imagine no. if it was. I mean, credit. I can tell it's Gene Hackman. So I mean, yeah. the, the art's good in that sense. It's, but yeah, it's, it's definitely more comic yeah. booky looking. It's yeah, he's he's fully like it's Gene Hackman's face on typical Lex, I would say, you know. Um uh but yeah. So I so see you're saying that's Michelle McPhifer's tits and the and the catwoman cover. Could be. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that they're not. <laughs> they are a sweat to painstaking detail to make sure yeah. every body part was correct. Yeah. Uh dear. Uh next up we got the Batman First Night issue one. Let's see what this is. Mm. Uh, this is Dan Jurgens writing with Mike Perkins on the art. I, I do think Mike Perkins is a good pick for a Batman book. Yes. Uh, so this is a, a Black Label Prestige Plus. So it's going to be three issues, all double-sized. So it's one of those. Uh, we have 
the year is 1939, the world still reeling from the horrors of the First World War, and World War II is about to start, <laughs> or has mm-hmm. started, depending on where you live, yeah. uh, is on the brink of the tipping into even more gruesome conflict as fascism is on the march and gathering strength in America's darkest corners. Against this backdrop, a series of violent murders has begun in Gotham, and the most recent emergence of the mysterious vigilante known as the Batman as uh, has the powers of the city... Uh, what's that? Has the power, the power brokers, brokers of the city living in fear uh, of institutionalized collapse. Uh, all of the evidence in the murder investigation defies the logic. The perpetrators are men who died in the electric chair. But when the Batman, and it's, it's, this is hyphenated, by the way, uh-huh. right? Uh, the Batman uh, comes face to face with one of these sickening anomalies. He barely escapes with his life, throwing into question his ability to survive in the world that is brutally evolving around him. Yeah. Actually, Joe, we just on that that war thing there, I got a comment on something on a, on a okay. movie review not too long ago where uh-huh. someone said something to the effect of uh, they said something like World War Two started in 1941. That wasn't the exact sentence, but the it, uh-huh. the implication of the sentence was that. And I just thought, oh, you're such an American. Just the, it yeah. didn't start until you entered World yeah, War Two, no. did it? Yeah. <laughs> And I'm like, no, it was still ongoing. We just didn't get involved until then. <laughs> World War II started in 1939. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> anyway. And you could even argue it actually started before that when the appeasement started. You know what I mean? I mean, so... for some, the moment Hitler got power in 1933 is the moment where yeah. really it was it was yeah. going. You so know? like, you know, but yeah, no, definitely it started earlier when uh, Europe went to war with one another again. Uh, yeah, good Lord. As a history, as, as a student of history, that that uh, annoys me. Yeah, that someone would someone would message that like, no, they were joking. Fine, ha funny, funny. Oh no, they were being hoity toity and correcting or yeah. saying something about something. Well, see, now I'm conflicted because I like when people try to correct Pete. But if they're <laughs> wrong, it only backfires. You know. Um, oh. Yeah. So this is a gorgeous cover uh, mm-hmm. by Perkins. Uh, it's got like. The shape of Batman and his cape, and then all the arts inside that, and then there's like negative space, which is not white; it's more of a cream, but it yeah. but it gives it that kind of old school vibe. Uh, this definitely feels like we're doing Gotham by Gaslight, but we're doing Gotham by 1939 mm-hmm. instead, <laughs> which uh, you know uh, that's interesting. I'm I'm here for this. I'm very excited. Like this this type of stuff. Also, it looks like there's a werewolf on there, or if that's supposed to be a representation of Batman, I don't know, but it's got pointy ears and claws. No, that's uh, Batman. That's definitely a Batman. Is that Batman with, yeah. with the claws like that? You're talking about the overall silhouette? Yeah, so the silhouette, the, it, it pokes off of where the guy's holding the gun, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, I, I yeah. think that's just maybe a more monstrous version of Batman. Okay. Dang it. I was getting worked up for it's a while. But... There, there is gangsters in like, suits with Tommy guns, yeah. though, if that's uh, of interest to yeah, you. Yeah, I, again, I, I love this era of Batman just because it's it was, it was Batman before they realized what Batman could be. Right, so it gets it gets a little bit crazy. Yeah. Um, well, I don't think the they're Jurgens, making. I think is the yeah. perfect. I don't think they're making this though as if this is Batman written in 1939. I think no, th- it's this a is story, like a new though. Elseworld of okay, this is yeah. Batman existing in that time period. No, I'm sure there'll be differences because mm-hmm. that's the point of doing this is that you can do whatever you want with this version of Batman. Yeah. But yeah, because yeah, this Batman is further away from the Batman that we like. I, I trace our Batman to Frank Miller in Year One, right? Like that's where, where modern Batman kind of starts. Um, so anything like, especially like early Batman, those are such a different vibe. And if he this did, is going to be doing that, that's going to be fun. He does kind of have the more sticky out ears to the side that the yeah. original Batman outfit had, uh, mm-hmm. based on this cover. Um, you know, I like Dan Jurgens is a fine name. It's Mike Perkins that gets me excited though. I yeah. feel like this concept with his art does sound really good. So mm-hmm. the art has me more excited than the writer does, but, uh, yeah. I'm certainly Although game. I think, I think this is the type of story that Jurgens is very good to tell. Because uh, he's kind of playing with history in a way. Mm. Uh, but yeah. Excited for this one. It's so also, uh, did you say it's one of the big prestige? Yeah, it's, it's going to be three issues that are all double size, give or take. Yeah. Mm. So, one of those. Uh, speaking of which, Batman City of Madness issue three is mm. out in February uh, with a phenomenal cover, which does kind of spoil the big moment in issue one that sold me on the, the rest of the book. Mm-hmm. But uh, yes, issue one ended up being fantastic by the end. I don't know, have you went back and read issue one of this yet? Not yet, because I know there's uh, gaps between them. So I was going to wait till it was closer. That's fair, that's fair. But you should definitely issue read two. it before issue two. Oh, no. I still have it saved. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's ready to go. Well, should it do? If Comixology survives. Um, 
No, it's yeah. not. <laughs> the, you know what I mean? It's getting really, it's the, everyone's moving over to Kindle app uh, soon. Yep. Um, so next up, we got John Constantine Hellblazer Dead in America issue two. This is the size Spurrier miniseries that started the previous yeah. month. I have to be honest, I didn't remember the starting, but uh, fair enough. I will say the cover is very nice. It's got a swamp yeah. thing on there. It's very uh, horror, you know, lots of reds and uh-huh. blues. Really, really nice. We got Batman Scooby Doo Mysteries issue two. Scooby Doo, where are you? One two six, um, and that takes us on to the collection, seemingly. So, uh, just to quickly run through these, we got Batman White Knight presents Generation Joker. Uh, that's a hard cover. We have Tales of the Titans. Uh, this is just a soft cover. Is this just the four issues that came out called Tales of the Titans recently? Yep, those yeah. are the four that I read. With, uh, the Hales, Tini Howard, Seymour Lando, and Andrew Constant. Yeah. Uh, we got Spirit World Collection, which is soft cover. We have City Boy Collection, which is also soft cover. We got the Vigil Collection, which is soft cover. Uh, we have all, Absolute All Star Superman reprint. So, mm-hmm. you know, speaks for itself. Uh, JL Ape, the complete collection. Let's go. Have you read this before? I, I have not, um, but I remember reading Wizard uh, Magazine when this came out, um, and just, you know, that cover will always live in my mind. So uh, I can't think of a better way to spend $30. <laughs> well, that's all over that. We got Lobo Big Fragon Compendium 1, <laughs> which is a 1,200-page soft cover <laughs> collecting various miniseries and one-shots that are Lobo-related. Mm-hmm. so fair enough if you're a big global fan and congratulations i am not <laughs> so nor am i but that yeah. cover still makes me giggle just because it's it looks almost like he's wearing a hawaiian shirt in a field of skeletons mm. uh, and yeah. this is an interesting one next we got justice league dark rebirth omnibus is this the first like rebirth series that's had an omnibus maybe because obviously that was, that was 2016, and you know, so obviously we're just getting to the point now where maybe they're old enough that they're going to start doing this. I, don't th- I can't remember another one. Yeah, I can't either, but there's another one underneath it, so maybe oh, yeah, they're, we'll, gonna, we'll they're starting to, to roll these out. Uh, so this obviously has the Justly Dark issues that are 1 to 29, mm-hmm. but it also has the various tie-ins and like event tie-in one-shots. Um, uh-huh. I'm assuming it also probably has the backups when it became a backup in Justice League. I- I would assume so, because that's where Ram oh, B... It, it does, yeah. It says yeah. there at the bottom, yeah. Stories from Justice League 1581, that'll be that. Yeah. And, it, and it also has the Endless Winter in there. It looks okay. like all of it. So, oh, yeah, so it's a beefy uh, boy. It's uh, almost yeah. 1,500 pages, so uh, very good. Do not and then, drop it on your foot. Then next up, we got the Flash by Joshua Williamson Omnibus Volume 1. So obviously his run went on a long time. Uh, yeah. This is 1,000 pages, and it's collecting... 1 to 35, plus a couple of relevant Batman tie-in issues and uh-huh. various things. Uh, but, so... Yeah, this has to be the first of three volumes, right? Because he went mm-hmm. almost 100 issues. Yeah. For sure. Okay. Unless they just... Nah, because it, nah, it has to be three. There's, there's no way they could do the second one be the rest of the run. It'd be too big. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because the next one would be the the like what you would say thirty six to sixty something. Maybe se- yeah, 60s... se- maybe seventy ish. Yeah. Yeah, and then the rest of it would be in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, that's so, interesting. Yeah. So that's volume one of that. Uh, if you mm-hmm. want, to... now I thought that run went very downhill, so I don't think I'd be interested in an omnibus. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's there. Oh, this although this omnibus, I would say, is where the, it was still pretty pretty good and readable. Oh yeah, the first part of it was where we were enjoying it more, for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then we got Barkham Asylum, (laughs) which is a Joker (sighs) dog and a... What's the other dog meant to be? It looks like someone's cat, it looks like. Is that a cat? Yeah, definitely a cat. It's Hugo Mange. (laughs) Hold on. Uh, Because this is Jester, the Joker's dog. Uh, the hinge pets clan. I'm looking. Yeah, I don't know. This uh, seems fun. Yeah, that's that's an obvious. This is uh, a a you know graphic novel. Uh, yeah. Original seemingly. And uh, then we got a hundred bullets book one reprint. So this is uh mm-hmm. four hundred and fifty page soft cover with the first nineteen issues of hundred bullets. So I 
I, I think that will be three volumes of that. I, uh, maybe four. I, I can't remember oh, how many there is total. I've only read the first, what, I think six issues. Mm. Um, got it from the library way back in the day. So Yeah, so that's there. Uh, Batman Superman World's Finest Volume 1, The Devil Neza, uh, soft cover. I assume it already mm-hmm. had a hard cover. Uh, Detective Comics Volume 4. Uh, this is the Tamaki stuff post the tower. So it's, that, right. it's the arc that was after the tower. <laughs> It's uh, the, the Riddler yeah. stuff that was going on. So that's a soft cover. Mm-hmm. Birds of Prey Progeny is the next Gail Simone collection. I don't know how many mm-hmm. have done of these. This is at least the second one, if not the third. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this is Birds of Prey 92 to 103. So I think this is second mm-hmm. based on those numbers. Uh, and then we got DC vs. Vampires Volume 2 soft cover. <laughs> I like to pretend this one doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Deathstroke Inc. Volume 2 Year 1 soft cover. I Am Batman Volume 2 Welcome to New York. Soft cover, Naomi season two. Soft cover. Oh yeah, forgot about Naomi as a character. <laughs> and that stinks because she was fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It felt like by season two, a lot of her relevance had kind of diminished. Yeah. Sadly, uh, Joker managed to stop laughing. Volume two, the Jurassic League. Soft cover, Tim Drake Robin. Volume two, soft cover, and that wraps it up. So very mm-hmm. good. Um, nice. Yeah, there you go. Solicits for February. That was a lot of collections. That, I'm not surprised, though, because it was quite late in collections last Solicits, if I remember yeah. right. So, fair enough. Mm-hmm. All right, well, with that out of the way, we do have a lot of books to talk about, so let's uh, get firing in right away, shall we? Mm-hmm. Detective Comics 1077, Ram V writing with Jason Alexander on the art. Yeah, Jason Sean Alexander. And not to be confused with George Costanza. Yeah, I left out his middle name, no, just so people might confuse him for George, for George Costanza. <laughs> it's too good. It's too good not to do. Uh, oh, dear. All right. So Detective has been on fire. I think this mm-hmm. issue is no, no less. You know, we're, we're kind of yeah. in this arc here where mm-hmm. they do a little bit of present day. The last time it was Batman just been held captive. This time he's getting walked walk to the gallows to be mm-hmm. hanged in front of everyone. And that's just a couple pages and then it's like, okay, flashback to Catwoman building her team to try and save him. And obviously, whatever plan she's going to enact is going to happen when they go to hang him. So we're building up to that. So mm-hmm. the, the sense of pacing building up to the payoff to all this is, is fantastic. I just, I feel it the entire time. Uh, so they have a meeting early on, which is Jim Gordon. Uh, you've mm-hmm. got Cheshire there. you got Selena. Uh, Cassandra Kane shows up out of costume. She's just, yep. she's just Cassandra, which I thought was interesting because you know, Gordon's there. Not that he'll, yeah. you know, maybe he'll ask who she is and they'll just say, ah, she's just someone. Um, mm-hmm. But it would be interesting if he ends up, like, finding out she's a Batgirl when his mm-hmm. own daughter was the first I, Batgirl. Yeah. I really do think this ends with, with him finding out about Bruce. I don't see how they can't, you know, with, with Gordon. You know what I, I mean? I mean, I could see them bending over backwards to make it not happen, but... I don't know. I just, I feel like a lot of the stuff Ramvi has been setting up with how much Bruce trusts him, right? That's, he went to him earlier in the run, right? When he was all beat up and um, they shut off the lights so he could take off his mask and Gordon's been respectful. So I definitely think this ends with, with Gordon in the inner circle. Assuming Bruce makes it out alive, of course. <laughs> I'm feeling confident about that. Yeah. So uh, also uh, Shoes is there. Yep. Uh, so that, that kind of sets up our, our, our team for the most part, and they're debating like how how the odds are stacked against them and all mm-hmm. this stuff. Uh, so we see some of the various like ideas play out. We see uh, Gordon gets Oracle on the phone for Selena to talk to, and they talk mm-hmm. about some of their their plans. Uh, Shoes wants to go back down into the tunnels to free the people who have been held captive mm-hmm. to have the asthma put in them, and she thinks that Grundy will be an ally. Yep. So she's saying, oh, if we can go and get Grundy, he can help. Uh, which, you know, sounds... Because he's unaffected by the asthma, right? Like, it doesn't seem to be affecting him in the tunnels like it is the other people. Um... Well, not just that. I think it's just he hates them being there. So he was well, yeah, quite happy too. to and beat up he, all the bad guys. He is kind of like the, the dark soul of Gotham, right? Kind of like when they play with Grundy that way. He was born in Slaughter Swamp, right? Uh, he's, he's kind of eternal in that way. Constantly reborn. Um, so this is almost like Gotham fighting back. Yeah, uh, I, mean, I against, love the art the in this. I oh, love the, 100%. The, the, all this art where they're in shadows, like, forming this plan. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, because Selena, Selena's not in her outfit, right? She's just in like nope. a, a black top and whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's, like, there's because she's wearing black, and then there's so much black in the negative space. Like, there's just a, an overall moodiness to mm -hmm. everything here as they're they're forming their plans. Even Oracle's sitting in shadows, like listening to the plan and mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, concocting. And uh, the big thing here, though, is she reveals that one of the the team members she's like brought in is Mister Freeze, mm -hmm. and Mister Freeze makes no allusions to the fact that he's only doing this because he wants something in those tunnels and he doesn't think he can get to it yeah. without help to get rid of all the bad guys so he's so he still sounds very evil as he's talking to them mm -hmm. uh gordon's not very happy about it in fact one of my favorite yeah. panels of this whole book is gordon mm -hmm. yelling are you effing crazy as selena just kind of like like folds her arms yeah. as if like yeah eh, whatever yeah because he looks quite monstrous too right like uh. the art there does a good job of making him look like a maniac. And then Selena countering that is completely like neutral. Like, yeah. I, you know, I've had worse ideas. <laughs> His reaction is justified though. Let's, yeah. be, let's be honest oh, here. 100%. Free but yeah, the art definitely goes out of his way to make him look like, because a lot of the issue, he's also kind of in shadow where they do that fun thing where he's all in shadow except for his mustache and glasses. Yeah, I think he... Uh, I mean, they do that with a lot of the characters, but I think they're especially playing with the idea that Gordon... Mm -hmm. He's not ashamed, per se. That's not the right word. But yeah. he's working with a bunch of people that are kind of more shades right. of grey than Batman is. And right. maybe he's a little outside of his comfort zone. But he wants to save Batman. In fact, mm -hmm. my favourite thing, probably my favourite moment in this whole issue is after this whole Are You and Crazy panel. It's the same page mm -hmm. where Selina tries to justify why they should bring Freeze... And she says to Gordon that mm -hmm. if this were reversed and you were the one being hanged in, in three days, don't you mm -hmm. think Batman would break every goddamn rule that there is to save you? And Gordon doesn't say anything. He just, like, you know, that's one of the panels where he's just in yeah. silhouette with just the glasses mm -hmm. and the mustache. And it's like, he would do whatever it took to save you. And it's almost like she's kind of guilting him into, like, you know, mm -hmm. you know you have to do the same for him. And that means breaking some of your rules it means working with people you don't like working with it means doing whatever it takes i love that justification because if there's one it's like at this point this if we're really building on this idea of like the people around him caring about him then that this being the motivator for him to yeah bend the rules more than he usually would to go and save yeah. him makes a lot of dramatic sense and it feels like it's you know it's playing on the relationship history uh, so it feels like it has a lot of weight behind it, and I, I felt the the impact of that yeah. that statement. It's definitely putting God, uh, God, it's putting Gordon in that spot of a guy that can go between both worlds, right? Because he went to talk to Montoya in the last one, yeah, right, yeah. and now he's teaming up with these otherwise you know villains, except for Shoes and, and Cassie or Cassie. Um, yeah, I guess we can go with Cass. Cassie's the Wonder Girl. I'm trying to keep them all straight. Um, but yeah, so I like that it, it adds him. He's this guy that walks in both as the former police commissioner, which kind of he always was because, you know, some like a lot of Gotham Central are the cops being mad at him for for working with Batman. Uh, so, you know, this keeps that uh, version of Gordon going. Yeah, and then Selina basically goes to visit Batman in Arkham Tower. Mm -hmm. uh, she sneaks in and says she has to be sort of like reminded of her motivations for doing all this stuff and she goes to see him and she sort of talks to him and keep in mind batman's like not in control right now he's been yeah. effectively possessed we know he's fighting it deep down mm -hmm. and when she talks to him it's kind of like she's talking to like a coma patient which is like i know you're in there fighting this uh -huh. so she's giving him some words of encouragement but when she's basically saying you know i i've tried to ask you to run away with me several times there's panels of her in her wedding dress mm -hmm. with him mm -hmm. on the rooftop and all that but it's all very moody, but it's this gorgeous full-page spread of her saying, I will never let you fall. And it's them kissing, but behind them is a giant bat face uh, sort of lingering over them. Uh, really good stuff. Or, or a wolf. I feel like this is the wolf that's, you know, in the asthma that we keep seeing. Oh, right, right? yeah, that makes more sense. I, I yeah. just... I'll, I'll be honest, when you do a close-up with this in comic art, mm -hmm. a wolf's face and a bat's face look a lot alike to me. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I can see why you think it would be a bat, but the fact that it's the uh, it's I, that, that I, I, Asmer that's trying to consume him I thought in his it, memories. I thought it represented the idea of the bat lingering over their romance, their mm -hmm. entire like lives together. You know? Yeah, and we'll see. And I took this as the the Asmer because um, Orgum told him the last time that you, the more you fight, the more it's going to take your most cherished memories. 
mm. right? This is the one that it's getting no, me to consume. Now that you've said, yeah, you've said it's the wolf, and I'm looking at the nose. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, the nose looks <laughs> yeah. more wolf like. Yeah. Yeah. But it just, I don't know. It, do you know what it is? It's the way it arcs up mm-hmm. at the sides it makes me think it's mm-hmm. going out to bat wings. Like, see yeah. the way it like, arcs up like mm-hmm. at the sides of the mouth? Yeah. Anyway. Sure. I mean, I get why you would think that, but, you know, I was giving what I, my interpretation of it was. So, but no, this this whole section, because um, the when she goes to him and he's in the chains, if there's just the, the art here, it makes him look so grotesque, you know? Um, it's, he's got like tendrils coming off the cape and like the ears are extra long and Batman's more pointy. Um, and it's just, you know, when she puts her hand on his face as that show of care, like she's talking to him, it's just, it all builds to that page with, with the, the asthma demon. Yeah. And a nice detail here is that she's taking her glove off to do that. She's not, yeah. she, cause the other hand still got a glove on, but the hand she's mm-hmm. touching his face with is just her bare hand. Yeah. And it feels very kind of intimate because of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so no, really good stuff. There's close-ups of her eyes at one point, which are gorgeous as well. Like the arch is filed in all cylinders. Uh, the R's and uh, so they they basically are like, okay, we have to hunt, hunt this cat woman down because she's she's concocting mm-hmm. something. But Prince Arson's just kind of like, eh, honestly, like we'll just move them. We don't want to look bad in front of the city right now, and whatever they're planning, like. They'll have to do it when the moment comes. They can't do it before then, and then we can make them mm-hmm. look like the bad guys. So, and I think this is going to come back to bite them. But I think there's a an arrogance here of like they can't hurt us, and mm-hmm. obviously we are all rubbing our hands together. Going, no, they're going to win somehow, some way. It's his phrase of "she's only a cat burglar," and it's like, oh, no, so he's way more than that, you know? Yeah. Uh, so no, all great stuff. The the final scene is Selena going for a new team member. And she ru- walks past someone on fire, uh, and she looks like she's very smug about this. Uh, yeah. And sure enough, she it's, it's Azrael, which was obviously set up in the backup to the last yeah. issue. And uh, she's like, hey, I'm missing uh, something on my team. Uh, a big armored archangel with a flaming sword. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, mm-hmm. aren't you in luck, Selena? Because here's uh, Azrael. So it, I, I do think it's interesting that Ram V's going with because it would be very easy to tell this story and have it be a story where it's Dick, Tim, Jason, mm-hmm. Babs, and I know Babs is kind of involved, and obviously Cass is kind of involved. Mm-hmm. But there's kind of this attempt here to go with a very different set of characters. It's all more shades of grey characters that Selena's uh-huh. putting together, and I think there's something interesting about that choice. That it's all the the less goody two shoes characters coming together to be the one to save Batman is kind of an a poignant kind of like, hey, it's the darker side of Gotham that came and saved you. It wasn't the right. bright side that you built. It was right. Uh, it's interesting. It, it's kind of got the Gotham that was, you know. Uh, so, but it's also like to involve the boys in all of this too. It's almost she's trying to keep their hands clean, mm. right? Keep them off of the Orgum's radar, too. Yeah. So it would surprise yeah. me if we see them by the end of the arc, though, yeah. if they all jump in to help with something. Mm-hmm. But uh, certainly, this planned and the team she's building are not with them. So yeah, let me just say when, when we turn that page and she's going down the alley and there's blood on on the ground, and then a guy comes around the corner on fire yelling a demon, I laugh <laughs> so hard. There's just there's a, a sense of timing with Ram V where he has this very dark sense of humor. Yeah, and I feel like Alexander's the perfect match for this. Um. But yeah, uh, it's just it... <laughs> it's so moody. It's so the, the art is so atmospheric, and it goes really mm-hmm. well with the story that's been told here, which is the sort of dark psyche type story. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this run started strong, but the last arc where Batman was getting taken over, and now this arc where he is taken over, and the mm-hmm. others are building a team to save him. I think this run's just been firing in all cylinders. It's just nailing this mood and vibe of Gotham in a way that. Like, you know, I'm, I'm missing from the main Batman book right now, certainly. So, mm-hmm. uh, really, really good yeah, stuff. It's Well, and it feels like he put all these pieces in in the first part, right? And now that it's coming to fruition. And I still feel we don't know what his endgame is. It, it right? feels like a run. It feels like, it, yeah. he's like he's not just writing an arc and then a, a new arc, which would be right. fine. Like, some writers mm-hmm. do that, and it's perfectly fine to just do a six-issue mm-hmm. story and then have a new six-issue story. Mm-hmm. But this is clearly a, a, a tapestry of, like, okay... I've got all these pieces to a larger thing that I'm building the entire time, yeah. uh, which 
often can be the most fulfilling thing when it's pulled off and right now it feels mm-hmm. like he's nailing it and i appreciate it as well just to move out of the backup here that both the last issue and this issue the backups have complemented the main story by just fleshing mm-hmm. out one of the details that was in here uh, in this case it's when shoes seemingly first get out of the tunnels with grundy she went to cheshire for help mm-hmm. and it basically just kind of explores that She's never really asked her for help before and Cheshire's feeling all weird about kind of like, you know, she abandoned her daughter, so they've got a strained relationship and Grundy's just this awkward third party sitting there <laughs> trying to, you know, not yep. get involved. Uh, but Cheshire's talking about how she's still this vicious killer, but she showed sympathy for a child like after her daughter was born and that made her mm-hmm. want to like just stay away from her because she's like, oh, she's made me weak. She's made me compassionate and I can't have that. Um but she asked for help to go deal with the, all these kidnap people uh, and stuff, and Cheshire says yes, uh, which mm-hmm. to which, you know, Shoes hugs her. And I love that panel, actually, because the art he- here isn't, like... Like, I think Casper Wingard's art, who does the, the art for this, it's Dan Waters mm-hmm. writing this back up as well, for the yeah. record. Um, Like, it's not necessarily completely to my taste. I think it's a very pleasant art style it's very consistent uh but i do think this like negative panel at the top where they're just standing in the white negative space while she's hugging him mm-hmm. or while she's hugging her sorry it's a very good way to show that the world has faded away in this hug like cheshire's world yeah. just disappeared and she doesn't know how to react i think it captures that moment of awkwardness for her really well mm-hmm. um and then the next panel with the world's back she's returning the hug and grundy's like huh so uh, yeah, the confusion on, on Grundy there is also makes that because that like you said, the you got uh shoes on her tippy toes hugging Cheshire, and Cheshire looks almost confused, right? Like she's shocked. And then when it goes to the middle panel, she's leaned in, uh, and Grundy's looking confused. Like there's a lot that's being said without a lot of dialogue there. Yeah. Uh, I think the layouts in this backup mm-hmm. are, are very well done and how they convey the story and it does tell a full story to you or at least gives you a good character study of these two that I, have been separated and you know she even brings up her dad at one point and how she ditched him and and whatnot yeah i care way more about shoes than i do about leanne harper right and and i know they're the same character right it's just the way that i was going to say being... i was going to, i was you're confusing me matt what are you talking about <laughs> no but right so I, 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 I get what you're saying now that you've said yeah. that but yeah go yeah, ahead yeah, yeah. Lane Harper in, in Green Arrow, right? There's this whole timey wimey, you know, uh, always looking for her. Blah blah, you know, they're they're tied to jumping around, and like that that's all fine. But here, with the way that Dan uh, Waters and Ram V have written her about, you know, I, I don't want to leave Gotham because Gotham's where I was abandoned. I'm not going to do to Gotham what you did to me. Uh, Gotham's my home, and you know that no matter what, you're still my mom. And you're toxic and you're a problem, but you, you know, deep down, you know, what's right. And I think I can get you to do what's right. So that whole page, right. Where, where the, the mug gets crushed as they're talking, uh, in front of Grundy. And, um, when, when Cheshire grabs, shoes his mask. I was like, let's go help the ridiculous spandex people. Yeah. Then. So Grundy crushes the cup after mm-hmm. shoes says F you mom. <laughs> Yeah, uh, which because there's a sweet moment here as well where Cheshire revealed that she actually did come to Gotham to see how she was doing, but yeah. never told her. She just sort of watched her from the shadows and yeah. actually saw two muggers coming after her and brutally <laughs> killed them. Now, obviously, yeah. Shoes is a good character and probably it doesn't like the fact that she killed them for her, but right. it's sweet in its own twisted way, mm-hmm. you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, and this goes a long way too, and I like Gail Simone a lot, right? But when she was writing Secret Six, there was this whole subplot of. Cheshire was being blackmailed onto the Secret Six by someone threatening Leanne. Mm. Um, and then at the point where it would seem like her and Catman had hooked up, she thought she was pregnant with another kid. She was like, oh, well, I have another one. I don't need that one, right? And it was almost one of these things where she was now free because they didn't have leverage on her. Oh, she's, I have another kid. And, and here I do like that Dan Waters plays on that maternal instinct not even instinct that maternal aspect of cheshire that she's this brutal killer who kills with poison in and, and whatnot but that's still her daughter and she still wants to try to do what's you know what's best 
Um, and that really well, resonated. Well, not knowingly, though. I think that's the point, is that she keeps trying to convince herself she doesn't want to be a mother, that she's avoiding all mm-hmm. these things, and it's not until she's sort of forced into it and she feels the warmth of the hug mm-hmm. that she really, mm-hmm. like, overcomes with the feeling. So I, I don't think she knew she was going to make this choice. I think if you asked her beforehand, she wouldn't think she was oh, going yeah, to. Oh, yeah, no, and that's not yeah. what I mean, though, but it, it's playing off of that maternal... You know, because she does go and check on her, right? With with the muggers and stuff, you know? So, uh, but yeah. And also the coloring here with Wingard's art, Wingard's art, like the soft pastels, yeah. like the, you have the, it, the green and the blue. It could and the not purples. be more different from the main story yep. as far as mm-hmm. the color palette goes. Yeah. No, it's just a solid little backup that just fleshes out uh, one of the couple of the characters that are in the main story. And I think this is a, a smarter way to use the backup is to sort of just to give a little bit more insight to something else that's going on. Uh, all right, Matt, what are you rating Detective Comics 1077? I'm going to give this an 8.5. Yeah, I think I'm I'm right there uh, with you. I think the backup's solid. I love the main story. Um, I think the build-up to where it's going is fantastic. Uh, yeah, I, I have very little to really complain mm-hmm. about. I'm enjoying this run quite a bit, so... Uh, that takes on to Batman and Robin, issue three, legacy number 69. <laughs> nice. nice. <laughs> uh, By the way, just to let you know, you got your wish. The night's lost in overtime. So I hope you're proud of yourself. Oh, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I can go on with Batman and Robin 69. I can taste the blood. Uh, oh, yeah. it's so good. Uh, no, uh, Joshua Wilson writing with Simone DeMeo on the art. And this is... Uh, following up, I actually, like, the first few pages of this book, I was like, okay, what the hell was happening last time? I don't remember <laughs> God, that thing. Uh, it's, uh, it's sort of, like, fleshed out, though, as it was it was going on, and that is that they're at Blackgate Prison. They're trying to get to White Rabbit, who has been hunted by a female character who is now going by Shush, who is Hush-like, and mm-hmm. they want to know where Hush is, uh, but she is Shush, which... Look, I'm not saying it's as bad as Scandal uh, Savage, right? (laughs) But calling your sort of protege to hush, shush, is... Like, uh, it's just, it's not, it's like, uh, I'm not amused. I, this is, if there was anybody but Williamson, I wouldn't be as annoyed. But he does this. <laughs> like, this is like, this is what he does. And like, that's fine. It's whatever. Like, I, I don't want, you know, I know next to nothing about this character. So, because yeah. I'm an issue behind on this. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, Batman's chasing her. Uh, White Rabbit's getting away as well. And Robin's chasing white rabbit because the terrible trio are hunting her down they're working for shush there's some fight scenes i'm very conflicted on the art in this book because it's obviously very stylized and it's got a very strong sense of style and color palette and all that sort of stuff so it looks good from that sense but i do find sometimes the layouts and the definitions and the action make it tough to kind of follow like sometimes it feels like parts of like say damien's suit kind of bleed into the villain's suit where the dark parts of the, the colors meet and all that and it just it, there was definitely times in this where it feels like it just isn't it doesn't flow as well as it feels like it should despite the fact that there's a lot of fancy layouts and some really solid art on its own in a vacuum but it just i don't know like I, i've been feeling this a little bit uh, more and more with each of these issues i'll be curious to keep my eye on that uh there's a bomb that batman diffuses that shush planted um there's a big car chase that happens up next uh batman tells robin to go back to school he's like no i already got bullied and met some teachers i had the whole experience let's get on with being batman and robin um so there's a big two-page layout for the car chase uh with batman trying to jump into the the convertible with the the villain and white rabbit and there's an explosion it's it's a whole thing honestly there's a very quick read i'll say that for it at the very least like it flowed very very quickly because a lot of it is this action stuff but uh yeah um the big reveal at the end is that man bat's actually the villain that sush is working for is because everyone just assumed it was hush but she's working for man bat uh and that's the cliff fire man bat's holding up damien and it says to be continued in the dark man bat returns which feels a bit meta to say hey yes we know he was kind of an anti-hero for a while 
but he's going to be a villain again, which I actually don't really want, to be honest. I kind of like no. good man bat, but yeah. all right. I mean, I always I feel like you can use Man Bat as like a, as a werewolf type character to where maybe sometimes it's in check and other times it's not. But I kind of like the fact that he can be a wild card. But then again, there's kind of too many bat villains that do do this, right? You know, like we like Clayface, Poison Ivy, Two Face, all when they do this. But Man Bat felt special. Well, you know, I, 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 it's this, I think the problem is though is, is, is the, the only reason why it feels like they do it with too many is because they chicken out and go back to being villains with yeah. too many of them. That's the problem. Yeah. I, I am okay with Clayface and mm-hmm. Manba and uh, Two Face is the one that should flip flop. Two Face yeah. is the one that makes sense to go back and forth every time, right? Mm-hmm. He makes sense, but Manba and Clayface, I would have been very content with them just staying being yeah. kind of good, right? That yeah. would have been way more interesting to me, but whatever like here we are um yeah like the the issue f- feels like it was mostly just one big chase scene right it, it, mm-hmm. you know, it starts off in the prison they chase throughout the prison they get to the batmobiles and it's more of a car chase at that point and that's all fine and dandy uh and the art is is good but with some caveats and i think i think you know ultimately i'm kind of lukewarm on the issue and i'm lukewarm on what the book's currently doing the most interesting stuff to me from the first two issues was actually seeing damien try to go be a kid at school and i would happily just take a book with him trying to be a normal student and Mm -hmm. not like kick the shit out of anyone who pisses him off like that to me was the most exciting part of the premise everything with the villains and the actual plot of like what batman's doing and what they're trying to stop I, i I, I'm yeah. barely, I'm barely remembering any of it, issue, yeah. issue to issue. Like, like I say, I had to like read a few pages of this before I'm like, okay, yeah, they were looking for White Rabbit. Oh, this character Shush is here. Okay, right. I, I can sort of piece it together and follow the issue from this point on. But it's not like I'm going in being like, oh, I'm excited for the next chapter in the story. I'm barely remembering what the the last part of the story was. So mm-hmm. I don't know. It's still an easy enough read. Uh, so, but this issue is like a. I'll give it a six. It's it's pleasant enough to get through, and it reads quick and whatnot. But it's I can't really go any higher than that because I don't think it's that good story wise either. So six out of ten for me. All right, what we got next then? We have Green Lantern issue five, Legacy five four one. Jeremy mm-hmm. Adams writing was Zermanico on the art. Now, this is what I was looking forward to. Now you weren't here for this issue last month. Nope. But. Uh, we were very, very positive on the last issue because mm-hmm. the tease of what Sinestro was going to maybe do with these jets that he had maybe done something to, to hijack mm-hmm. them, was very, it was a very good cliffhanger. Like, the way it sort of, like, teased it at the end of the issue was very mm-hmm. tantalizing. So, very excited to get out of this. So, I was very pleased when it started off with just, no, no, he's doing something bad with them. He is committing acts of terror on various cities hub city being the main one that he starts off with Mm -hmm. and then it becomes this race to try and get to like the other jets before or the other drones before they'll they'll kill anyone Mm -hmm. and to the point where it starts off with sinestro like on the big screens on the news saying that oh you all need to feel fear you've become complacent and effectively what he's trying to do is fuel his ring by making the entire planet so scared that it gives him his yep. powers back, which is very interesting. It's also very Freddy Krueger. <laughs> yep. Well, and also, like, uh, on, on, on more of a comedy side of things, it reminded me of that episode of The Simpsons where Sideshow Bob hijacks the air show, mm. and he's talking on the thing, and, and Lisa puts together. He's in the blimp because the, his voice is a little bit higher from the helium and stuff. And him talking over the the, the, the big screens reminded me of that. So... But I do like his plan, and I feel like this is a guy that that should understand Hal Jordan, that Hal's not going to just let him do this. Um, you know what I mean? And and I feel like he underestimated him here because of, you know, whatever has gone on in between. Uh, but, yeah, made for a fun bunch of action sequences. Yeah, all that stuff was great. Obviously, once they realize this is happening, Hal flies off Green Lantern style, uh, whilst Carol is doing the command center stuff in the control room, she's like trying to track where the drones are, and her fiance is like one of the guys at the mm-hmm. the comms, like talking and stuff. Uh, I think it was anyway. I don't remember what his name was, but I think that was him. <laughs> so 
Hal's flying around, and this is some gorgeous coloring. Like, see the mm-hmm. uh, the page where there's like an explosion in. I don't know what city this is. It looks like it could be Vegas, to be honest. All the bright lights. Yeah, but... yeah. No, they they he, they send one to Vegas. They send um, Vegas. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. And then they're sending the other plane to DC. Which uh, respect to Zermanico for getting the geography of the ship right, because a lot of a lot of places don't. So a lot of TV and movies. But Zermanico has it down here. Yeah, don't worry. Uh, this is Neil Breen caliber of getting the geography of Las Vegas right. <laughs> I understand. I don't understand that, but I understand Neil Breen, so I'm gonna laugh. Do, Matt, just be proud that you live in the same city that Neil Breen calls home. He does. Yeah, that's why all of his movies are set in Las Vegas. <laughs> oh, I did not know this because I've he lives never there. Seen a Neil Breen movie. Oh wow! <laughs> You're gonna have to give me a list, sir. <laughs> Most of his movies are free on Internet Archive. You can find them. <laughs> all right. Uh, but I'm not going to waste my time watching all of them. I've, I've fallen into those shots before, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, oh, that stuff's great, though, because like, there's like a fighter pilot trying to like, track down the drones. Mm-hmm. And as Carol warns Hal, hey, these drones have never been beat by actual pilots. And sure enough, this drone does like a, a flip and ends up behind the pilot. And I thought this looked great. All the speed lines. Yep. Um, it was good stuff. Uh, and we see that Sinestro's got a bunch of aliens helping him command the drones from his base, uh, which is in mm-hmm. uh, Arizona, apparently, in an old missile silo. In Tucson, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this is all happening. And then, of course, Hal swoops in uh, and tries to save the day. He's chasing after the one that's going to Washington. Uh, mm-hmm. No, actually, this one's in Paris, I think, because that's the Eiffel Tower. Uh, and no, no, no. That, this, this is Vegas. That's the stratosphere. Was oh, this still Vegas? The one that he blows up. Yeah. So it goes to launch a, a missile, and he. Oh snags well. It. In, in that case, uh, the entire conversation earlier was irrelevant because I was talking about another page when I was saying Vegas. Oh, so yeah. So the the page that I looked at is is where it says engaging target at the top, and then yeah, no, that is the Eiffel Tower, but we have a fake Eiffel Tower here. But what Wait. he's aiming at isn't the Eiffel Tower. That's the stratosphere. No, 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 no. So I was confused there because I thought he was onto a different city by the time he uses his weird, like, you know, he's got the different layers of, like, visible spectrums in his eyes, mm-hmm. and he finds that, because the, 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 the drone goes into stealth mode. Oh, no, yeah, okay, we're talking about two different ones. You're talking about with the, when he cuts it in, in half, right? Right, this is Paris this now, country. right? Mm, I think so, yeah, okay. I thought you were talking about where the, the first plane that he takes down. The no, first no, 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 but, but I've talked about that already. That's why I was talking about Vegas there. Gotcha. Th- this is um this is where they send them uh th- th- yeah because they say that this this, Tokyo. Clo- this cloaking it's, device is here is it Tokyo okay it's okay Tokyo, yep yeah there uh, to be fair there is a tower like that in Tokyo as well yes there is the Tokyo Tower yeah uh so that's fair enough but yeah he he flies to yes. there and because he's like okay I, c- I can look at different spectrums of light so he does yeah. that so he can see the plane even though it's got a cloaking device mm-hmm. and takes it out. But then Sinestro's plan is to send two drones to different parts of the world at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, although this is after Hal grabs a, a a newscaster in Tokyo and basically tries to pump up the world and basically, like, hey, Sinestro's trying to scare everyone, but don't worry, I'm out here. I'm going to do everything I can to save everyone. Don't be scared. That's what he wants, blah, blah, blah. So it's a very inspiring little sort of cocky speech, as you do, which uh, makes Sinestro pissed off. But this little detail in the art here is you can just see mm-hmm. Sinestro's hand, like, tightening as he's, like, yep. hearing this on the news. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's getting pissed off. Uh, so he flies off uh, to, to try and deal with these last two drones. And because they're going to opposite sides of the planet, uh, one's going to Moscow, I think, and the other one's somewhere in the US. Uh, mm-hmm. He flies up as high as he can go, and he's he basically tries to put out two constructs, and he has to rely on the guy in the command center, who I think is Carol's fiance, to yeah. basically give him the the precise like adjustments to make sure they hit, because he can't actually watch them go where they're going because they're mm-hmm. too far away he's, he's in the middle of the planet and he's sending right. these two constructs out on either side yeah, he has to do some telemetry as best as he can with his willpower yeah. but he's still going to need help for the math and stuff because yeah. yeah they're going to to dc and to moscow so he needs so... someone and you know, this is the fiance in the command center to mm-hmm. like basically just like tell him his like you know just the adjustments that he needs to make you know okay you're a couple mm-hmm. of degrees off like this way or whatever and I thought this was really fun. I think forcing Hal to work with the fiance was a nice little mm-hmm. touch here. 
Um, he sends out a construct of a big bird, a falcon or something, maybe an eagle. Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, and then I actually, I thought it was like a puma or something like that in the first page. Yeah. Right. But then all the pages afterwards, where you see it from the front, it looks more like a dog. It does. Yeah. Cause I, I thought it was a cheetah, right. Cause we're going for speed and whatnot. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah. But the more I look at it, the more it looks like a, like a dog. Like he's got a square head. Like a pit bull, kind of. So I, I guess if I have any critiques of the art, it's that one yeah. nitpick, is that this animal seems to change, this construct. Yeah. But Yeah, the bird stays a bird. Like, I don't know what kind of bird this is supposed to be. Like, is it an eagle, hawk, whatever, a phoenix? Um, but, but yeah. Uh, yeah. But it makes for a fun sequence nonetheless, because they, oh, they yeah. both are so different, right? We can track which that, side's going to which. That panel is so good. Um, it's... It's funny. I, I would have thought you'd send the bird to the US because you know you know the, the bald mm-hmm. eagle and all that. But yep. if it, it makes a lot of sense though that to just take the panel at its sort of face value and the east mm-hmm. is east and west is west, so it would yep. mean that the bird's going towards Russia and the yep. puma slash dog <laughs> is going yeah. towards uh, the US. But hey, whatever. Uh, but it's a gorgeous page though. It's a gorgeous panel and. Uh, sure enough, uh, the constructs get there in time and smash the, the ever-living crap out of both of these things. And you mm-hmm. actually see in the panels at the bottom the explosions above the Kremlin and above the White House, just to... Uh, uh-huh. Or the Capitol, or the I think. Ca- yeah, it's the, the Capitol. Yeah. Uh, so, really nice stuff. And Sinestro's pissed, of course. Hal goes to find him, wants to track down his location. And uh, Sinestro's like, oh, I just wanted to get home, and this stupid United Planets is... <laughs> got the blockade yep. and the big cliffhanger of the issue is that all of this failing has made sinestro so angry that it looks like red light is coming out of his ring mm-hmm. so now th- that doesn't make a whole lot of sense given what we know about the rings but in the previous page sinestro does say that there's something wrong with the spectrum of light which is mm-hmm. which i'm guessing explains why that his ring is now channeling red light even though it shouldn't because it's not a red lantern ring right so, and the fact that Hal could even make his own Green Lantern ring also suggests that the Spectrum's not maybe... Something's wonky, yeah. yeah. So I'm wondering what's going on with the United Planets and the Guardians and all of that stuff, right? Like, I wonder if there's some treachery afoot. So, yeah, something that's suspicious, nothing... yeah. Yeah, with the with the emotional Spectrum. Yeah, the, the Hal and, and uh, Sinestro face off here. I was like, okay, we've seen this a bunch of times. I had no, like... Never did I think it was going to end with, with Sinestro channeling rage. So, Joe, Joe was uh, good about this, cool. is that before I turned the page, I thought he was going to say with hope and that he was going to be green. That's uh-huh. where I thought it was going, because I thought he was going to, oh, you've inspired all these people, and uh-huh. that made me feel hope. Um, don't get me wrong, it makes sense that it's rage. I'm not critiquing mm-hmm. this. But I'm, what I'm saying is is that I I, I, I think it's impressive that it could have, it felt like it could have been going one way, but it went a very different one. And you know unless there's been like a small moment somewhere like sinestro's mm-hmm. never really been a red lantern before so this no. uh seems like a fun as, as far as i know he's he's done what he was an indigo for a hot second yeah obviously um, green and yellow um, are the two main ones uh green, green yellow yeah green yellow and then i think indigo's the only other one i've seen him that was towards the end of john's he's run yeah. and it wouldn't surprise me if during blackest night he was either a white lantern at yeah. one point maybe but yeah I don't know. Well, because he's died and come back too, so I think, I think the white would have worked for him. Yeah. So. But anyway, um, uh, I'm curious to see yeah. uh, where this is going. I think uh, this Green Lantern book's been uh, mm-hmm. doing really well because I I enjoyed Adam's Flash run quite a yeah. bit, but it was not, it had like a ceiling. You know, it was never really above like just a really solid, enjoyable family Flash book. Whereas mm-hmm. I feel like this, like he's aiming higher and he's like hitting yeah. it higher as he's going. I, think- I felt like he was a bit more intimidated by the Flash because I feel like he's a Flash guy, right? And he was kind of stepping into sh- the shadows of, of creators before him, like Mark Wade, Jeff Johns. Here, I feel like he's like, I'm just going to tell a really kick-ass Green Lantern story. Um, and he's and he's going for it, and I appreciate that. I just think it's more ambitious. I think the craft and like the suspense and like the build mm-hmm. up of the big moments, especially in these last two issues, has been really good. The action sequences have been great. Obviously, having Zermanico just doing mm-hmm. this fantastically detailed and expressive art uh, mm-hmm. is just phenomenal. It just obviously gives so much to it, but it is really quite good. Um, I enjoyed the interaction with Carol and Hal in this this issue. Uh, even even Hal and the fiance was kind of an interesting like like mm-hmm. back and forth a little bit, 
And then Sinestro, of course, being the big one that obviously we get the, the full <laughs> monologues and whatnot from. Like, I think all of it clicked together. All of it worked to create... If anything, I'm just surprised that the whole plane hijacking thing was just a one-issue thing. I could have seen this been... Yeah. I could have seen this been like a threat that was lingering in the background for a while. Uh, I was almost surprised that we went straight into it. But it did feel like a big deal that he immediately was like just throwing missiles at Hub City. Like, he absolutely killed people in this. Yeah. Before Hal could intervene and stop the rest of them. So... It feels like there were stakes. It feels like he, he, you know, he's no less a villain because he was stopped. Like, he, you know, he absolutely was doing some really bad shit here. So, curious to see where it goes next. Um, so, I, I, I didn't remember what the backup was going into this. I turned the page, saw that it was this, like, Sinestro's kid thing again, and went, you know what? Yeah. I'm good. <laughs> so, basically what this comes down to is, like, he, he broke, you know, at the end of the last one, he breaks into that place, right? Uh, where that has all of the um, has all the records, and he sees that that's his dad. Um, he gets all excited. Uh, he goes back to like the the guy that he's working for, like stealing. Like it's very Oliver Twist, right? Um, and um, he goes and, and now that he knows who his dad is, he goes in. Uh, who's the attack? It's it's a, a bunch of people. What are they making? I feel like they're kind of like drug dealers, but I can't remember because there's a lot of a lot of alien words on here. The story um, really stuck with you, Matt. I can tell. No, just because. Well, I, I I read it quick. I got the beats, but um, anyway. So he he goes and he takes these guys out. He ends up bringing his score back to the guy that's like raising him, like the orphan um, minder type dude. Uh, and he doesn't want to, you know, give him everything because, um, hold on. You're right. It didn't make that much of an imprint on me. So I feel like I'm <laughs> leaving stuff out. Because uh, he tells me it's a drug den. It was a bunch of creds and illegal meds. He tells him it feels a little light that he's coming off the top. Um, mm. He's like, well, no, this is what I did. And then he's just like, you know, I gave you everything and this is how you're going to treat me. Tries to yell to him, calls him Korg. And he goes, you know, um... You know, why do you keep calling me that? And he's like, well, that's because of your birth world. Um, you're from Korgar. That's how I name all of you. Um, he back talks the dude. The guy comes to attack him. Um, and uh, he's like, you know, you brought this on yourself. Um, I raised you. And he goes, oh, yeah, it ends with, with Korg. Or we're calling him Sin Son because that's what the, um, that's what the, uh, so let's, let's call him. Um, that he'll remember, he'll he'll never forget. Um, it's like it's Tomasi, and I like Tomasi. I just I don't care about this kid. I don't want to do another secret Sinestro kid, right? Because we did that with Sornik. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like are we gonna tie it into that? Like, you know, does does Sinestro know? Because it doesn't seem like Sinestro knows this kid even exists. Because they even say that the you know. The guy tells him that your your family just dropped you here. It's very much like uh, in in uh, the new Star Wars sequel trilogy when they they're breaking down Ray. So I, I'm wondering if there's going to be some kind of you know nobody could know that this was Sinestro's son, so he was hidden, you know, and the mom died or whatever. Um, so so yeah, like it's it's fine. The art's okay. I, I like the the bright colors. It matches kind of the even though it is a little bit dark, it matches the kiddiness of it all. Right, um, but yeah, it's a shame that it's the backup to an otherwise fantastic book, you know. Yeah. All right, that's Ray Green Lantern. Then, what you give an issue five? I'm gonna give issue five an eight. Yeah, I think it's. Yeah, I think it's. I think the last issue was just slightly better, but this was a really <laughs> good, fun issue of him taking down the planes, and uh, it felt it felt like a big deal. It felt like exciting. Yeah, yeah, ten mm -hmm. for me as well. All right, World's Finest Teen Titans, issue five, Mark Wade writing with Emanuela Lupacino on the art. Mm -hmm. Last issue did a lot of setup of how the, the rifts were forming in the Titans, yep. right? Tensions God. were high. Really makes me hate Roy. I, I missed last issue too. <laughs> yeah. That last issue where they're at Wally's, God, Roy has never come off as a bigger, you know, a-hole. Yeah, and um, then he gets really butthurt when he hears them talking about him. Because like, yeah. it really built up this idea that he tries to make up for everything he's lacking by talking mm -hmm. about how much wealth he has. Mm -hmm. uh, and that happens again in this issue when he gets mad. He's like, well, I live mm -hmm. in a mansion. None of you could know what that's yeah. like. Blah, blah, blah. 
Um, and Dick's like, yeah, okay, sure, bud. Uh, <laughs> so this issue remi- it was a little flashback at the start which tells mm-hmm. us of when the titans had a a, a new member try out mm-hmm. right by coming on here uh haywire is the name yep. and he basically after they sort of succeed in their mission he starts stealing all these government secrets off this computer so they can use it to like save people and stuff he says to help people yeah. and Bob was like we're not in the blackmailing business like we weren't gonna blackmail then what are we gonna use it for <laughs> and he's kind of stymied uh so so they ditch him they say no like we don't have room for people like you on our team so go go away uh so he is really pissed off about it he he hurts wally when wally sort of speeds him back to, to where he mm-hmm. lives um cut back to present day and deck and donna are talking about uh, garth acting up and not talking mm-hmm. to her uh dick still talking about how batman wants him to leave the titans we know that that's a big been a big stumbling block mm-hmm. and basically that's when it comes back in from what the cliffhanger was which was that um bumblebee and uh as well mal but i'll say guardian now uh, yeah it's guardian because you, you think they were setting him up to be uh boy blue or Harold or whoever right yeah um but yeah, but he's wearing the Guardian, uh, the Metropolis Guardian stuff, which I thought was a nice little twist. Yeah, so they're fighting this villain uh, mm-hmm. out here in the city, and you know Robin and Donna shop to help. But Toy Boy, the one, that's that's the creepy guy from the convention who yep. was obsessed with Donna, and this mm-hmm. is where a lot of these different stories throughout this run so far started to all come together, because what it turns out is that Haywire is the one who's put all these guys together to form a team the terror titans to be the mm-hmm. evil version of the teen titans and that realization was a lot of fun i thought realizing that he was the one sort of calling yep. the shots from the command center um as the titans basically all stop listening to each other and end up getting each other all in trouble you know wally doesn't listen to dick's orders um right. you know uh speedy shows up and doesn't listen to anyone either and it ends up like the, half of them end up getting hurt artemis shows up as part of the terror titans yep. that was a fun Which reveal I- I think that's a cool look for her, right? Because she's got the one eye, it's like, like a, um, a half goggle over her shooting eye, which I thought was... But that's you know, makes her, yeah. It, it's a bit death jokey, right? By also being its own thing. Um, and which Artemis is this? Because this isn't the, the Amazon one, right? This is the... Kind of like the Young Justice-y... Yeah, I, I was thinking this is the, the, the yeah. Young Justice animated series type of Artemis, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, um, it's the vibe I get, yeah. anyway. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, so they get their asses kicked, and it's caught on camera, um, they all look kind of shit, and the big part of the end of the issue is they're all sort of moping about this, and they start arguing about how they didn't help each other, right. uh, someone says, I think it's a Speedy says something to Garth, so Donna defends him, but then he, Garth right. gets annoyed, says, I don't need defended, and then she's like, oh, you're talking to me now, are you? Ugh. And they're all breaking down, and I thought this was all, like, as much as they're all being kind of annoying... I thought it was mm-hmm. all really well set up over the last couple of issues about all the all these yeah. little things that were bubbling that was going to make them all turn on each other. And the big ending to this is that Dick's trying to give them a pep talk. He's trying to say they can solve this. And they're like, look, we're meant to follow your orders, but we can't trust you. Like, you, you're, you're the only one who's not told us who you really mm-hmm. are. So this issue ends with Dick making the choice where it sounds like he's saying he can't tell them. And you see the shadow of Batman behind mm-hmm. him. The final page is him taking off his mask and saying, "I can't disagree with that anymore." Or no, anymore. So here we yeah. go. Uh, my name is Dick Grayson, and we're going to beat the Terror Titans. So it's kind of this sort of like he's finally doing the thing to unify the team by sort of finally giving them the trust mm-hmm. that he's making them all give him. Uh, so it feels like a big deal. If you, uh, yeah. Also, I'm excited about how Batman's going to react to this news. Oh, not well. <laughs> no, I don't think well either. <laughs> um, but I, what I like about Wade here, and because he, he's such a student of, of the mythos of DC, right, is it feels like this Teen Titans, Dick took what went wrong here and applied the opposite to the new Teen Titans. So there's definitely a much more familiar vibe when you get Corey and Beast Boy and Cyborg and Raven all there, right? There's not a lot of this, well, we can't trust each other, uh because dick already learned that yeah uh, if it feels like with this th- with these guys yeah it feels like if, if i don't think wade's going to do this but if wade no. went on to write new teen titans after mm-hmm. this and we did that origin 
I think the idea is here's you're right. He's learning a lot of lessons that make mm-hmm. this formation of that team, and it's maybe why that team is the one that kind of survived. Like right. when we think of the Teen Titans coming back together now, we think of the new Teen Titans forming mm-hmm. again. We think of Beast Boy being there, of Cyborg. Mm-hmm. Uh, Don is obviously there too. Like some and Wally's yeah. there as well, but we think of that version with Raven. So. Uh, it, it, yeah, it's an interesting little. Uh, like, it felt like this was what the whole, whole issue was building up to, and mm-hmm. a, a big part of this was this big middle chunk was the fight where they're all just making mistakes, they're uh, getting their asses kicked, and these villains are just wiping the floor with them. Uh, Bumblebee's feeling bad because she didn't call in for backup earlier. Uh, there's like, there's a funny moment where Toy Boy, I guess that's what we're calling him, uh, yeah. is wrapped up. A guardian and like a slinky dog with his powers mm-hmm. uh just just silly stuff like that and that's just before well, speedy and, and jumps he turns out uh, what dinosaur toys on them that's yeah. what, what's attacking them or it's a dragon or something along those lines uh lupacino having a lot of fun with the art here um, yeah this was a really fun issue where mm-hmm. a lot of the plots did because i think it did a good job of like seeding all these things back from the first couple issues i think this is where mm-hmm. a lot of it all came together though uh yeah because well, Connor and they, wasn't into the last. Connor was not a fan of the spending time with the the three boys at the house. Whereas see, I really I like, like that. I like that yeah, a lot. Yeah, I like actually. that it's taking the time to pre- present them as teens, right? It's not they're not just superheroes. And yeah, it might seem annoying when when Wade's trying to work in like social media and drones and all this other stuff that you know modern teenagers are. But he also balances that by you know, the whole dynamic in the last issue between Wally and Garth and Roy and even Wally's parents are kind of like, Roy's kind of a bad influence, you know, and all that pays off here because, you know, Roy felt that vibe throughout and he's carrying that on the chip on his shoulder. So when he shows up and starts trying to take things into his own hands, you know, it all feels, it all feels like proper teenage angst. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. And, you know, after this all happens, like, they've actually got a uh, talk boy, for lack of a... Because I can't remember his yeah. name. I can't either, but I like that he's proto-Oracle almost, right? Yeah. Like, he's he's the one that's finding out about, like, Haywire and Toy Boy. And yeah, but w- yeah. what they've got them doing here, though, after they all fail, is they try to have him, like, erase it from the internet, but, like, <laughs> yeah. everyone's been filming it on their phones. He's like, no, yeah. you, can't, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. This embarrassing yeah. failure is all over the internet, and it, it's not going to go away. <laughs> It lives forever. Yeah. So uh, that means they have to redeem themselves in the eyes of everyone. Yep. And the idea that they care about their image is definitely mm-hmm. something that feels a bit more teenagery versus, yeah. you know, like Batman doesn't give a shit like what people think of him. I mean, no. he probably wouldn't let anyone get away with a phone in their hand. He'd probably be like, oh, right. batarang that thing and well, smash as, it. But... As we've seen in The Dark Knight, right? He he has that network that he builds that he gives the, the login to, to Lucius. So I'm, I'm assuming he'd have something like that. You know, to destroy any footage of himself. Yeah. Uh, so he knows what he's doing. I, yeah, I think this is just a really interesting sort of, like... Origin story doesn't feel quite like the right word because the team is already there, but it feels like yeah. we're in... You know, we're six months into the team, it feels like, mm-hmm. almost. And that's not really true because the flashback at the start is, like, some time ago. before. Yeah. But it feels but yeah, like an early days Titan story where we're really getting the growing pains of them growing up and yeah. Dick's really starting to grow up here is what it feels like. Uh, so, yeah, no, yeah, I like that. It, it's playing with the dynamics between the team yeah. and the best way, oh, just like the world's finest book does with Batman and Superman. Yeah, it, it does just so. say at the start several months ago, so it could still be mm-hmm. in the first year. It, it could mm-hmm. still be that early on. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, well, and, just double check. And, like, that. is this a limited series or is this an ongoing? This is an ongoing, I think. Okay, so I was gonna say because if it's also a limited series, it it would also serve as a you know a year one almost of Teen Titans, where kind of everyone's gotten their own spotlight um, up to this point. Uh, but yeah, no Wade Wade and Lupacino, it's a great team as well. Like I mean, I he's think, another guy that's getting getting great artists working with him. I mean, uh, I, I think it wasn't issue eight or nine just in the solicits today. Was it? I don't remember, but <laughs> yeah, I'll go check. I don't know because because even because even thoughts. I thought maybe this would be like out of ten or twelve, you know. I mean, um, I, may, I may end up only being that, but yeah, it's uh, you know, but yeah, but no, it's it's a lot of good time. Um, and this feels like a uh, uh, also well, the actually, same Robin. To be fair, it's not in February solicits, but I don't remember there okay. being a final issue, so I, I don't know if um yeah. 
It is wrapping know. up, but it, it definitely yeah. didn't. It never had like out of issue something in it. Like it was that was okay. never in the solicits. Gotcha. Um, but as I was saying, uh, like this this Dick as or this Robin, we we know it's Dick from World's Finest. They seem very similar as well. The the one that goes on the date with Kara, you know, there's there's a vibe to him, you know, and and I'm liking that, like you said, they're acting like teenagers, you know. He he puts together. They're not getting along. What can I do to to be this the leader this team needs and he finally does what's right so. yeah it's like he's having a growth moment both as mm-hmm. just a person but also as a leader and i think that's yeah. uh that's, that's cool uh what mm-hmm. are you giving world's finest teen titans i'm gonna give this an 8.5 yeah i'll i'll just go uh this is more like an eight for me um mm-hmm. i definitely like green Lantern more than this i would say Okay. Uh, but it was very good, though. I'm, I'm enjoying the book quite a bit. So, Speed Force, issue one, Jarrett Williams, writing with Danielle Di Nicolo on the R. Uh, so this is our, our secondary flash book, uh, with Wallace and Avery being the uh, the main characters. And, uh, yeah, so it was very intriguing having a second flash book for the first time in a long time. Mm-hmm. I mean, third, technically, if you can the Count the Jay Garrett book, but the the yeah. Golden Age characters kind of feel like their own separate little. Yeah, line. they're kind of. I don't want to say they're walled off because they're not really walled off, but you know, I do feel like they're off in their own corner. Yeah. Um. Sadly, though, I kind of hated this book, Matt. I don't know how you felt. Bro, me too. <laughs> I was waiting. I was waiting to hear what you said before. Um. I don't hate the idea of it. I like where it ends up. Kind of. Um. The dialogue, though, was very hard to read. Oh, and again, it was so... It, it's like, one, there was a lot of it, but two, it uh-huh. felt it just didn't flow very well. There was just moments where I just I was, like, struggling to piece oh. together the sentences. It was weird. Yeah, there was that, and I couldn't tell whose narration we were supposed to be getting early on. Like, is this Avery? Is this Wallace? And then when he said, my family, I was like, oh, okay, well, this is Wallace. But, um, yeah, it was just kind of all over the place. A lot of this, again, social media stuff. I, I don't, again, I get annoyed when they just try to make their own thing, right? So, like, I think it's called ViewTube in uh, in the DC universe. Like, we've seen that in, like, the Cyborg book and, yeah. and other places. And it just, it always just comes off as hollow. Like, this is one of my big issues with the Fire and Ice book and why I kind of had to drop it. Is it's trying to be too much of modern times. And by doing that, I feel like the, the writers get over their skis. And it, it just ends up coming off like, I don't want to say cringe, but it's just, it feels off. And I get distracted and then I end up not wanting to read it. Yeah. Um, I think the yeah. art's a little hit and miss as well. There's like yep. Connor's face. Because Connor, Connor Kent, uh, Superboy, yes. is on the, the first couple of pages. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's playing video games with Avery and Wallace. And yep. his face on that first page is something else like it's <laughs> rough he looks bad like i think wallace and avery look fine they look, they look mm-hmm. very animated they look like because they're really into the video game and mm-hmm. look very angry oh i'm going to kill you in a really fun way the, but connor looks awful yeah the, the the still shots are tough in this whole issue um the the action sequences when the flashes get going i feel like dinicola's art is is pretty okay like it's still not my favorite it's still very manga inspired and you know I, that's a taste thing uh but yeah once they start running around i feel the art really comes into its own but anytime mm-hmm. they're just kind of standing around talking it ugh, it's rough times yeah um i just i didn't think it flowed very well i thought it was a chore mm-hmm. to get through this to be honest like yep. uh, like the the talking back and forward was just just very irritating to actually listen to um mm-hmm. Basically, Wallace and Avery, the plot here is that after they're playing video games for... Which felt like a long time, to be honest. It felt like we took yeah. up like a third of the book with this opening scene. Which I, and that I, game is it's supposed to be like Smash Brothers, right? Like they're, Sounds like it, yeah. Yeah, okay. Although those are yeah. definitely PS4-inspired controllers they're holding. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and that's where, again, like, again, whatever. That's, that's art doing yeah. art in the DC universe. But... Um, but they basically detect like some stuff running in the speed force or something yep. something's not quite right uh roundhouse has got a little cameo because he was meant to shop and play video games with them but he didn't show up mm-hmm. um but they go racing looking for what this anomaly is and it's these mm-hmm. two people running at speedster speeds and like mm-hmm. red and white suits and they're trying to, to stop them but 
Uh, basically, after they have a bit of a chase and uh, I don't want to say a fight per se, but uh, no. the the ultimate re- realization here to sort of just skip to later on when they're sort of deducing mm-hmm. what's happening is that Music Meister is turning a bunch of people into his own evil speedsters, and he's using the power of frequencies and harmonies to yep. to make them run fast. Or something. I like. I'll be honest. Like I'm looking through this. I, I got so confused at that last page. Yeah, the not mi- the last last page, but the one where they go to the headquarters of what I thought was Spotify, which is weird, right? <laughs> um, well, and- even even before that though, I, I like I'm looking through this issue as we're talking yeah. about it, and I'm like I don't remember like a lot of what this middle of the issue, other than just mm-hmm. them chasing after these other two characters was. Yeah, it's a whole lot of nothing. And yeah. then you get to the headquarters of the bad guy, and it's all these people in these white and red suits with music symbols on their chest. Yeah. And the narration from the villain going across the top of the page, like, I just, I found that such a chore to get through. Like, he's, he's just monologuing about shit. And then the final... So, final did, did you... Go ahead. I was going to say, the final page is just him yeah. with lots of speech bubbles, just, like... I mean, here, here's... I'm going to read the final speech bubble, right? I just want... Like, yeah. does this make any it's sense to you? Let the melodies soothe your mind and eye. The music ma- meister, I'm your guide now. I'll school you in the best practices for success here at moving forward. Rewiring your brainstem, cerebral reasoning, neutralized check. Yes, too damn easy. That, that, I just, I, 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 so, I feel like I know what the writer's going for with that type of tone, yeah. but I just, it's not, it's not working for me at all. I just found that shorty read. So, right, so what this company is, right, I felt like they were, uh, uh, like, a streaming service, you know, like like Apple Music or Spotify or whatever, and he was almost, like, hosting a show, right, and that that show is hypnotizing people, you know, using these harmonies yeah. and stuff. There's the service that, is called Symphony, with two E's Symphony, at the end. Symphony, yeah, and, and so the, the two speedsters that he gets are Masa Menos, who are two Spanish-speaking speedsters that were on, I think, on the original Teen Titans show. Um, and um, so as far as I know, they already had a tie to the Speed Force, so that made sense. But then when we end up at this headquarters and everybody's wearing, like, Hydra uniforms, like, that's this red, like, symphony, I got so lost in that. And I'm like, okay, so wait, is he unlocking like the speed force for random people through using harmonies and vibrational frequencies, which makes sense. But if that's the case, how is he like, is he hypnotizing them? Like it didn't seem to make a lot of sense. And that's when I got to the end of this. I was like, Oh, I hope Pete didn't like this because I don't want <laughs> to read another, you know, <laughs> like, like I'm going to force you. Uh, I, yeah, I hated this. I, I thought it was a shorty read and I knew Probably just about four or five pages in. I'll finish it to talk mm-hmm. about this first issue, but yeah. like I knew I wasn't going to be reading issue two of this. Like I just I could not give a shit what's going on here. Like yeah. I'm, I'm I'm it was a shame. It would be cool to have a fun Avery and Wallace book. Mm-hmm. I just did not like how this was written. Uh, I don't think it flowed very well, and I don't like the the dialogue of the villain or even the dialogue of some of the heroes. To be honest, like, the narration yeah. throughout I just didn't like reading. Like it just did not flow yeah. at all for me. This. I feel this needed more editing. I feel like this needed to be more clear and concise. Yeah. You know? I, I, I wasn't familiar with this writer, but certainly mm-hmm. if I remember their name, which I don't think I will, but if I do, yeah. then I will not be looking forward to their future books well, based on this issue. So when I looked at this at the shop, because uh, I was going to pick this up, I tried to pick up Flash stuff, right? Uh, instead of getting it digitally. Um, and I, that's what I was going to do. And then I saw the, it, it, the last name of the writer was Williams. I go, wait. And for a hot second, I thought it was Williamson. I was like, Williamson back on Flash, I felt like I would have remembered this. So I open it up and I look and I'm like, oh no, it's Jarrett Williams. And uh, that's not a I, name that I recognize. I, I was wishing for Williams halfway through yeah. this. Which is um, not, which is saying something. Oh no. Wow. So he they're they're doing a story in the the Teen Titans Beast World Tour Central City. So I'm sure it's gonna be more of these characters. Yeah, at least that'll right? just be one story in an anthology issue though. Yeah, and then um, the other books Jarrett Williams has worked on seem to be Rick and Morty uh, and Raiders in. Yeah, a lot of tie-ins to Cartoon Network stuff. Um, So, so yeah, but I'm... 
This was one of those ones where, like, I'm pretty sure Pete's not going to like it, and I didn't know if Connor was going to be on, but I was like, Connor's definitely not going to like it um, with the amount of speech bubbles in that just kind yeah. of nowhere. No. And this, this so was... it, this it was... makes me feel like my, my regulator is on point yeah. at this point. This was an instant no way I'm reading this issue too. I hate yeah. this. Uh, yeah. So, all right. What are you rating Speed Force issue one, Matt? Uh, this is a 4.5. Yeah, this is like a three for me. Yeah, I, yeah I, I thought it sucked. So, <laughs> well, uh, not for me. Uh, Outsiders issue one, Colin Kelly and Jackson Lansing writing with Robert Carey on the art. Mm -hmm. uh, so, this is an interesting book because it's Batwoman teaming up with Luke Fox who are looking into investigating mysteries of the world and things that have went unnoticed. And that's where he shows up in Pitchy's Heart at the start of the issue. Mm -hmm. And then as it goes on, it has some big ties to a, a major book from DC's past, which I have not read. Um, Me neither. So when it got to the end and revealed this, the thing that it was sort of tying into was planetary, mm -hmm. I was like, huh. You know what? That's something I've always meant to read because it's only it's a 27 issue Warren Ellis mm -hmm. book. I've heard it's good. Um, but so a lot of the connections here didn't do much for me, and I, you know, Kelly and Lansing, they're not always the best writers. So I, I do think there's some wordiness yeah. in those first few pages. I was actually a little mm -hmm. bit worried that I wasn't going to like this. I will say though that once they started investigating the the thing they were there to investigate, I got a little bit more into it, and I was a mm -hmm. bit more into the okay, this giant ship is like lodged under the ice in Antarctica. It's kind of the, like the thing, but more like sci-fi robotic what's going on here yeah uh I, I got a little into it as it was going on look the, the idea that they're gonna investigate like the the histories of the dc universe in this like way i was like this seems familiar i don't know why this seems familiar yeah planetary I, I, i'm here for it and then i was like the drummer the drummer was in planetary although in a different form right yes yeah, so i did that in the because i looked this up afterwards yeah. and it said there's mm -hmm. three main characters in planetary yep and one of them's the drummer but it was a dude i was like okay yep. all right right who can the drummer's powers seem to be they can detect and manipulate information streams such as computer data links and radio yeah. radio waves T talk to machines was how it was described on wikipedia uh, right. when, I, when i looked and up. so that that makes sense for this going forward but then as they start getting into the ship and i'm seeing stuff like the the century babies and i was like Okay, that's like the authority in in and Jenny, from what I'm familiar with that. And then we just go full planetary towards the end. Like this is like a multiversal, you know, this is a multiversal ship that got lodged in there, and the people are confused. And Luke and yeah, and the Kate end of the now. the issue is this character, the drummer, picking up this mm -hmm. book that says planetary on it. Which yeah. in hindsight, now that I'm looking at page one again, I'm assuming these panels of what looks like a book mm -hmm. that's been stained. Or from yep. that that book, I will say my first critique of the issue actually is that it's not actually easy to read those that text because the dark yeah. browns that are stained behind the, the black text make it tough to read. So mm -hmm. I think some more effort could have went into like making it a, a you know eligible because I had to kind of really try yeah. to to read some of those words, which mm -hmm. was a shame. Um, so I will say for two of us who have no real knowledge or ties to planetary or like nostalgia mm -hmm. for it. Uh, credit for making me intrigued despite that like that's that is something yeah. worth you know applauding you know, i'm mm -hmm. intrigued I, i'm absolutely intrigued i, I kind of want to read planetary now uh but yeah. you know i so i read this before speed force and i thought it wasn't perfect i thought okay it was a bit wordy like like look foxy's whole sales pitch to batwoman i thought was a mm -hmm. little bit too wordy for those first few pages yeah and then but then I got into it by the end. I thought, okay, that wasn't perfect, but I was definitely intrigued enough. And then I read Speed Force and went, oh no, I hate this book. All of it, the Outsiders, I was like, okay, Outsiders actually feels like the good one now. <laughs> yeah. Compared to the other one, this is like night well, and day. I, yeah, I like this from, from the beginning because I like that pitch from Luke to Kate, although it makes me wonder why those those two, like I get with Luke and, and they're like, why members of the Bat family for this? Like why did Kelly and Lansing pitch that if it was their pitch because um, uh, if you've got a bat logo somewhere it'll help the book sell i guess th yeah that's that's what i'm guessing um but i mean if this is like a backdoor to some like like integration of wildstorm type things like they kind of did with wildcats but it's going to be more like this and i don't need to know as much um i'm curious to see where this goes uh just because again with the with the planetary the stuff that i looked up and 
what Planetary did was it took like concepts that we're familiar with from comics and did them in a way, you know, that, that uh, would yeah, not even them. just comics. It sounded like it did like an issue where they investigated something that was like, I don't know, Bigfoot or something like that. Like it was just mythology things as well. <laughs> Say less, <'cause laughs> you, you know, but yeah. And so when, when one of our, our listeners was talking about this and they're a big wild storm, they're like, yeah, I, I can't believe that we got a backdoor planetary. No one was expecting it, you know, yeah. or that's something that's going to reference it at least. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I, I think the fact that this drummer character sticking around definitely makes you feel mm-hmm. like they're going to do more connections to it as, as time goes on. Yeah. Um, but no, very intriguing. Um, so, and the art is, is, is not bad. Like, I think there's some nice, there's some really nice panels of Batwoman fighting some villains near the start mm-hmm. in the like, darkness, which I thought looked quite good. Mm-hmm. Um, I think... You know, they're talking to Lucius on the bat plane on the way back, to, or the way to Antarctica, and uh, Kate's got like a like a winter Batwoman suit that yep, she gets like given. A parka. Yeah, which yeah. is, is kind of neat. Um, so that's kind of kind of cool. Uh, I think the art really sings though. Once they get into this, like, because inst- mm-hmm. they've drilled a hole into whatever this big thing is and they deduce yeah. when they're in there that it's a that it's a ship but they say that the teams they've sent in have not made it back out right so they're they're thinking it's killed everyone that's went in and sure enough when they go in uh and this is luke batwoman and this this drummer character mm-hmm. these like big turrets come out and it's all machines so it's all like okay this is interesting because it's like techno sci-fi this is like you know cyberpunk style stuff and the drummer actually deactivates the machines by uh tapping one of the turrets and obviously in the moment i didn't know what the drummer who who, who they mm-hmm. are so i thought they were doing something with frequencies or something with, by yeah. tapping it uh but similarly though they're communicating with the everything and getting it to shut down uh but we get in this big walkway so it's, it's super sci-fi it all looks really cool yeah uh but then it's also a little bit like uh hellraiser <laughs> because you've got all these like all the previous people who came in to try and investigate it are mm-hmm. all strung up uh, like they're being sacrificed to the machine or something like that. And then the voice of the, the, the ship starts talking to them in big text saying, I was a home to heroes. Their victories were within me. Um, and, you know, it sounds like it's going kind of crazy, but, uh, you know, but they basically talk to it and talk it down, the drummer uh, being a big part of that. And... Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, basically they're they're able to talk it down, and Luke even says we might have even made a friend in this thing uh, mm-hmm. by talking it down. So, and luckily most of the people that they thought were dead are actually returned alive. Only one or two actually died. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a happy ending all things, but looks like yeah, this is just one of many things we want to go and investigate. So it kind of makes a case for okay, this book we're going to go and investigate weird sci-fi and horror stuff, which is a selling point to me. I, I like yeah. that idea. Um, yeah but uh yeah weird weird that it's outsiders banding though right because like to me that's not what the outsiders typically are yeah it's very um, different they're basically just using that name for yeah. the name and that's it like it's not this is yeah. not the traditional dc comics version of outsiders this is something no. else but, but yeah honestly calling it dc planetary or something would have made more sense but obviously mm-hmm. they wanted that to be a surprise i guess yeah, yeah. so uh, yeah um but no it was it was something that i was kind of on the fence about to something I'm very open to. Um, yeah. And if the art's going to stay like this too, right, it, if it's going to get much more sci-fi and horror, um, I'm, I'm here for yeah, that. The ending, before she picks up the book, we see like all these like outfits in these chambers and it sounds like mm-hmm. this was the, the, the ship was the planetary, them investigating stuff throughout the multiverse mm-hmm. and this was like, different members of planetary or something you know, before they all seemingly died or got lost somewhere. Yeah. So yeah, it's setting up some mysteries to explore and and whatnot, but very interesting. I I'm intrigued. Like it, it wasn't a complete home run. There's some clunkiness early on, I thought, mm-hmm. but the art's generally pretty good and really sings once it gets to the sci-fi stuff. And the premise did what it should if you're trying to link into something from the past. Is that it made me want to go and check it out. Now, will I? Do I have time? Uh, probably not. Yeah. But <laughs> um. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe, maybe on one of the quieter weeks, I'll intentionally read like an old series just by choice rather than just a Patreon yeah. book. I don't know. I, I definitely thought about like, hey, maybe maybe on those quiet weeks, and I need something. I'm gonna see if my shop does have planetary. If it's yeah. in print. Maybe, maybe yeah, like yeah. on week one, because week one typically is only three or four books. We can mm-hmm. be like, yeah, that, you know what? This will be the week where we read planetary one issue at a time or something. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So looking at the artist, um, uh, Rob Carey. Yeah, because I, I don't know this name, but th- this is one where the art turned out to be quite good. Yeah, so he did an Aliens Resistance book in 2019 for Dark Horse. Oh, I, uh, I've probably seen his work then, because I think I read yeah. some of that. Uh, Dynamite, James Bond, 007, a uh, book called Red Atlantis, which is at Aftershock, some Miller World stuff, um, So and The Shadow Batman, uh, the second series, that was mostly Dynamite um also so interesting okay yeah so not not a lot there but um definitely if this is going to keep up to par i could definitely keep reading this book for yeah. the art and to see where the story goes because like you brought up with with uh, kelly and lansing sometimes they they whiff on things um this though it feels like there is a foundation to to build off of yeah so Plus, you know knowing that i was dropping speed force it's easier to say yeah. hey I'm, I'm more game to keep this mm-hmm. one going for now yeah. Uh, so, yeah, what were you going to give uh, Outsiders issue one? I'm going to give this a solid eight. Yeah, I'm going to go 7.5. I'm not going to quite mm-hmm. say it's great, but I'm definitely intrigued enough to mm-hmm. you know, keep keep seeing where it's going. And hey, we'll, we'll see if me and Matt decide to do some sort of classic series or something. But mm-hmm. uh, all right. Wesley Dodds, The Sandman issue two, Robert Vendetti writing with Riley Rosmo on the art. So you weren't here for this week last month. So no. well, just briefly, what did you think of issue one? <sighs> So, look, I like Venditti a lot. I thought that first issue was very, very wordy. Um, mm, a lot, a lot, Yeah, a lot of dialogue, a lot of, almost in the tone of old comics, a lot of the narration. Um, I liked it, though. I liked that it, it's, like, again, I'm not that familiar with the Sandman outside of JSA. Um, so has Sandman always been a shadow analog? Because, um, like, I've never read Sandman Mystery Theater. And I feel like oh, I should. I, That's yeah, I don't know. Uh, um, but here, the the fact that he's a, a rich guy um, who's going into the underworld using a, like a gas, right? I was just getting shadow vibes from this. Uh, it doesn't help the Rosmo art. It was, you know, because the first time I had seen Riley Rosmo was in the Batman Shadow book. Um, so everything from the first one, I, I liked enough to, to pick up number two. I liked issue two significantly more because it wasn't as wordy. Um, and it, it really seemed to take the premise that we had and moved it forward with this whole almost anxiety of World War II on the horizon. And what does that mean for, for Wesley going forward? Yeah, so. it's interesting because I agreed the first issue was wordy, but I still kind of liked mm-hmm. it overall despite mm-hmm. my dislike in Erosmo because I thought the concepts of like him trying to you know, sell non-lethal weapons to the military mm-hmm. and then the, the tease at the end of someone discovering who he, not only who he was, but finding his book with all the deadly gases that he's trying yep. to keep hidden. I thought that was a really intriguing ending. I think this issue, I didn't like quite as much. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if that's just because it was the ninth book <laughs> that I read this week. So my, my, my tolerance to get through it was a little bit mm-hmm. tougher. But, you know, so he's, his place is burned down uh the, the you know the fire department just think it's uh, an arsonist or a robber who'd burned it down uh, and, and got yeah, killed yeah burglar who got caught right so they're like oh it's an open and shut case we we got the body yeah but of course wesley finds that his journal's missing so he's really terrified mm. that someone's got it and he's staying with um is, is it his fiance's dad that he's uh He's st- well he's not staying with well, but he's, he's staying in the same building yeah. he's like the floor up in the same building yeah. and then his dad's friend the, the other titan of industry that, that got him the interview in the first issue uh, with the gases. Yeah, he's yeah, staying yeah. in that same neighborhood. Um, and he's having nightmares of what his gas could do. And he sees like mm-hmm. a villainous version of himself, like a villainous Sandman, which turns out to be a real thing. At the end of the issue, yeah. we see whoever's got his journal has got a sort of darker version of his suit yeah. and is going to go out there with this more deadly gas to, to, to kill people. Mm-hmm. Which, I, you know, I do like that. And I do like Sandman investigating. You know, he's like checking out who who, yeah. who the arsonist might have been and he's doing some detective work i i, I enjoyed that those parts well yeah. enough for sure the, where, where he goes in there and deals with the henchmen but they're on amphetamines so he has to get more direct and he he shoves the gas canister into one of their mouths i was like that that's some good action sequences and i'm not bothered by the rosmo art like there's there's some wonky faces here and there well, and I, some wonky I, I, proportions what i said last time is that yeah. when the gas mask is on it looks fine when it's regular human faces it looks really bad <laughs> you're not wrong though yeah. um but no but, I, but, I, I, but like, I i like this tease of this villainous mm-hmm. you know sandman yeah. at the end uh which 
don't get me wrong, it's a very common comics trope to make the arch nemesis mm-hmm. just be the evil version of whatever yeah. the hero is. But, like, I- I'm cool with it because the book feels pulpy. Honestly, mm-hmm. I think that, like, the book's fine as far as, mm-hmm. like, compared to issue one. I think, now that I'm looking through it again and talking about it, there's nothing that I really want to complain about versus the first issue. Like you said, it's actually a less wordy, so yeah. technically it might even be the better issue. I think just for whatever reason, I just wasn't as into yeah. it this time when I read yeah. it. Yeah. Well, and, and again, it's up pulpy. We all know how much I love pulp, and when yeah. Vendetti does pulp, it's kind of right up my alley. So, like, I'm not surprised how much that I liked it. So, after I read the first issue, and I was, not that I was down on it, but I was kind of like, I hope it's not going to be this wordy. I hope it's not going to take me a while to read every issue. So, when I got to this one, you know, it got some points for me getting through it quicker. Because, like, before I knew it, I was in the, you know, off world preview. And I was yeah. like, oh, okay, cool. This, this, this happened a lot quicker, so... Yeah, uh, um, I... Like, I'm definitely... I'm probably down to read the next issue still. I think the... The fact that I'm definitely dropping Speed Force, I don't have to worry about that taking up a yeah. slot. Uh, and th- things kind of combined in this week because the like, detective went double shipping. So, because week... Mm-hmm. This week, last month, wasn't that big. Like, it was no. actually kind of a quieter week. This month has uh, inflated it quite a bit, so... Yeah. Uh, they, it felt like a bit tougher this time, but I think it might feel better uh, with a, a book or two drop that mm-hmm. you know, because because Vigil's done, of course, that's just, that's just done yep. for now, and with Speed Force not being a, a book I stick with, I, I suspect yeah. I won't feel as much strained reading them uh, next time. Mm-hmm. But uh, all right, what are you giving uh, Wesley Dodds the Sandman issue to? I'm giving this a seven point five. I, I enjoyed it, but there are some you know, some a little bit of things, but not not too many. Yeah, I, I think I'll go a straight seven, which is higher than I was thinking when I was reading it. Mm-hmm. But looking through it now, I don't. I actually can't see anything to complain about really, other yeah. than just the same, you know, Rosmo art issues right. that I would have had before anyway. So I, I'll give it a seven. Um, <laughs> thinking about it, it's actually better than um, some other stuff. But mm-hmm. all right, the vigil issue six. Ram V writing with Dev Paranimic on the art. This is the final issue of this series. But the ending, I'm happy to say, does have mm-hmm. big bold letters saying the vigil will return. And I, I actually did see Ram V tweeting about how he's happy that there is plans for more vigil down the line. Oh, good. So I'm um, excited for that because the concept of the vigil and what they are is so cool. And mm-hmm. this turned out to just be a big introduction to them. And it feels like there's more story to tell. We've got an arch nemesis. We've got... Mm-hmm. You know, it feels like the team is just finally coming together here at the end, now that they all know the truth that they're creations Mm -hmm. um, from when the Doctor was in this other in-between space world kind of thing. High high as balls. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, and this issue is really well constructed where it's, you know, the... uh, what was the kid's name? I I've not learned... Is it Castle? Castle, thank you, yes. I knew it was chess-related. I was just trying to remember. Mm -hmm. Um so basically he is explaining what the bad guy is going to do now that the team's all split up he explains how they're going to go after each of the the various members how they're going to go after the regular human at her place and then they're going to go after arclay at the subway station and it all sounds very bleak but then Mm -hmm. we get like the rest of so it's sort of like we see parts of all those stories and then the villain calls castle and is like hey you're my creation. You're one of mine. Like, mm-hmm. is your allegiance not wanting to change? And then he's like, no, I'm smarter than you are. I'm better than mm-hmm. you are. I will destroy you. He's very matter of fact about it. And then we see that, no, no, all of these things that the villains are doing that Castle predicted, mm-hmm. all are happening, but they all have outcomes that they weren't seeing coming. He's already mm-hmm. figured out how Saya will be there to help because uh, yep. there'll be two of her at the yeah, you know, at and, the and pointing out that say the the when they had say a follow the one girl, right? He almost got an affinity for her and her life and her family. He, he grew right? attached. Yeah, he grew he, sympathetic he, to her. Yeah. Yep. And so of course he was going to be there to help her out, right? And then you know um, when they went to ArcLight, it's like you know the the trains run on electricity. So even if there was any electricity. The fact that the train was was late, you know, left there was there was some there for him to charge up. All right, so it was all. Well, was hold on. You like... said you said that kind of weird. They shut down yeah. power to the subway station, mm-hmm. but because the train tracks power the trains because it's electric trains. Yep. 
they have a backup that always has power. So he right. gets power from that. Right. And so he was ready. So all these things that we thought were bleak for, for the team turned out to be plans from Castle because the uh, – what's his name? Hep. Hep got a little bit too overconfident. Yeah, that's the villain. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, it's not even plans, though, because it's not like he put these into motion. He's just mm-hmm. predicted – and figured out that this is how it's all going to go down everywhere. Mm-hmm. And he, he's so confident that the the sort of the main henchman who comes up to him, who has powers to dematerialize people and is actually yeah. seemingly, at least for now, killed the big brute guy. He comes right. up with his gun. He's got Castle right in his sights and he's smirking. And Castle basically is like, like, here's what's happening. This is how these other things are all going mm-hmm. down. And I'm so confident they're going to go our way. You should just take your shot. And he does. It doesn't work. Mm-hmm. He's fine. And he's like, I believe this is a moment that calls for a smile. And Castle looks so creepy smiling. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he explains how all of the scenarios worked out in the team's favor. Yeah. And we get the reveal that, that the shapeshifter Saya was there to protect the other one. Mm-hmm. Um, and Nia is the one whose name we can yeah. remember. Yeah. And then how Arclight still wins at the train station. Right. right? And then dodge you know like she's not around right now so that we're building up to where she is but then it reveals that arc lights powers actually like electrify the air and that's why the gun that he fired at castle wouldn't work and he Mm -hmm. didn't know for sure but he was very confident that he was already in the area and that's why because all this other stuff that's happening already happened earlier in the day it's not happening Mm -hmm. concurrently with this the siege on the base where the vigil actually hang out um and by this point the shapeshifter Saya has already infiltrated the the troops and has taken out the the transmitter that's blocking Dodgy's powers, mm-hmm. that's blocking all this other stuff, and yeah, uh, then Arclight takes care of this henchman dude, and they're all back together. And Castle's like, "I knew you'd be back," and they're like, "Ah, oh, you're such a little shit." Uh-huh. <laughs> like, don't well, say especially it. Especially Arclight, because Arclight was shown to be as grumpy, right? Because he lost his family. Yeah. So see all day, he's like, "I still don't like you." He's like, "Yeah, I know." Uh, that was kind of the vibe. That yeah. I was getting from but him. It, it's a big hero moment though, even though it's really mm-hmm. dark, because Arclight mm-hmm. basically disintegrates this this henchman dude. Yep. And the panel is just the fragments of him in the air, and it reveals mm-hmm. Arclight standing behind him with the others. And it's like this is like a hero moment, but you also just disintegrate someone, which is kind of yeah. dark. So Yeah, for uh, sure. It's a great moment though. Uh so yeah, but the, the the bad guys have got a bunch a bunch of helicopters and stuff coming. The doctor comes in and says, Hey, we need to go, come in here now. And they're all in together, and it turns out that Dodge has been out of commission because she's been hooked up to that. It's a bit effectively they're cerebral, but instead mm-hmm. of like like amplifying psychic abilities, it amplifies her ability to sort of like phase and shift, mm-hmm. and it basically turns what they're in into a ship that can go into the space between spaces, which you were joking earlier. Uh, the, bleed the bleed is where they're yeah. going, so they're they're in between dimensions uh, mm-hmm. where they go. And for some reason, when they do this, it rains fish. All the bad guys are, like, hit uh-huh. with fish. Uh, and Hep's not very happy about this. Mm-hmm. So this is the big cliffhanger. It's like, no, no, they've gotten away from the bad guys. They're kind of more a full form team now. And it feels like a setup for a sequel. It feels like a setup for the rest of the story. So, yeah, yeah, the vigil will return. This is not the end of the story. And we were hoping for this. We were hoping this was because it didn't feel like it was, mm-hmm. it was going to have time to wrap everything up. So I am very pleased that this is like, no, 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 there's a second series or something coming later or whatever it's going to be. But this story's not done. Like these characters yeah. are too interesting to just quickly wrap up and never see again. Yeah. And I wonder what's going to happen to you going forward, because they also mentioned that the doctor, when he thought of all of the vigil, he thought of them as a team and them working complementary to each other. Yeah. Right. Which now, like... Now that they know this, is that going to add a wrinkle, right? Now that they know that they're creations of his, you know, like, is that going to give, you know, to conversations of free will and and all this other stuff? Well, that's Um, something that's already thematically brought up in this issue, mm because Castle talking to Hep saying... Because because he's he's saying that he's smarter or, Mm -hmm. like, you know, I'm I'm evolving, I'm intelligent, and Hep's like, oh, you think you're going to achieve singularity? And he's like, yeah, I'm going to destroy you. Like, he, he's already yeah. challenging the idea that he's going to become more than what his creator intended. And I think right. that's a theme that all of these characters with the Doctor are going to be playing with, is that they are going to become their full-fledged own beings, even if their backstories are somewhat lies, even if they're mm-hmm. created from scratch from a, a, an obscure source. 
I think a big part of this is going to be how valid their lives are as individuals along the way. That's going to be a big theme mm-hmm. of this. It has to be. Um, yeah, the, and that's that's what I'm excited to go see because once that that wrinkle started to pop up, it was like, okay, definitely Ram V has more to say about this, and hopefully we get a chance. So I didn't see that that he had you know said that you know you know keep your eye on the horizon for more visual. Yeah, you know, no, it's, it's really cool. And at the moment where castle gets to be smug because he just sort of like mm-hmm. is so sure that he's figured out how it's all going to play out yeah and then it just proves to be right and then we see how it all played out it was very much like a heist movie where we don't know what the plan yeah. is and then you get to see it all sort of unfold and it's like yep. that excitement was really cool and it feels like something you could do with this character castle a lot because they're always yeah. piecing it all together and seeing all the likelihood and outcomes mm-hmm. uh, in their head it's like uh, the guy from a team who's like i love it when a plan comes together you know <laughs> kind of but more savant yeah <laughs> uh but yeah really good stuff um uh, excited for more of these characters the only thing is is there's so many new characters that i've still not learned a lot of their names so i think yeah. whenever this is coming back i'll probably want to go back and just quickly reread because it's only six mm-hmm. issues it's not that much yeah uh and just sort of like recap I, who they all are again yeah the, the big brutish guy i still don't know his name but the other ones i have pretty much down yeah um say a dodge you know castle arc light um Arclight and Dodge are the, the, the most, you know, stereotypical superhero, so they're easier to remember. Yeah, um, I think that's fair. So, so uh, what are you giving the Vigil issue 6? I'm giving this an 8.5. I, I really like this issue. Yeah, 8.5 for me as well. I think the only complaint I can really give is the issue 1 was so perfect that I think it never mm-hmm. quite hit that. There. But the concepts of the last, like, three issues were so good. They revealed that they were creations from his mind, and then the backstory about them in some kind of Philadelphia-like experiment that sent them into this mm-hmm. other dimension. And then how the, how, how, like the backstory and the concepts that are leading to the conflict are so interesting that I would say the concepts of the book as a whole are like a 9.5. But I would say as an individual issue, I think issue one was like a solid 9.5 and yeah. the best one. Yeah, because that was so strong, but I do like how he seeded as it went. Like you got to uncover things almost like your castle yourself, right? And you start putting together that their ideas and what they're capable of and how they're going to be used. And um, I think that was a really good sense of, I don't know, maybe he didn't do it on purpose, of almost like meta storytelling from, from Ram B. Yeah. Because we all know that he likes to put the idea of ideas and creations and that type of stuff. And this went full force into that. Yeah. All right. <laughs> We got one book left, and I am very hungry. Um, yep. I, I need to give this one my all because it's an important book. But goddamn, <laughs> I am I'm struggling for energy here. But yes, Danger Street issue eleven. Uh, Tom King, Jorge Fornes mm-hmm. on the art. This is the penultimate issue, as the fate narration at the start tells us, yeah. <laughs> even. Um, and this is where a lot of the things are coming together. Uh, Jack Reacher comes to see Lady Cop at her place <laughs> in the middle of the night, which is very threatening, to be honest. I, yep. I would say from anyone else. But he's like, hey, I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you about that Helmet of Fate because he's actually flown the private plane belonging to the Commodore and the Outsiders have got him like under captivity, basically, on the plane. Uh, the Monster Girl's got her tentacles wrapped around him. Uh-huh. And he's very upset about it the entire time. But the main gist of this is that Jack Reacher is asking her for the Helmet of Fate. Because- it's Jack Ryder. Oh, so I keep saying Jack Reacher. You're right. Yeah. Sorry. I had to Rider. double check, and that's why I didn't correct you the first no, time. No, you're like, totally right. You're totally. I'm Reacher, saying Reacher's a character on TV. That's that's that stupid Tom it, Cruise character. It two, it two Tom Cruise yeah. movies. Although yeah, Werner Herzog's really good in that first one. Yeah, yeah. I'm just having a brain. Fart. Like I said, guys, you're I'm funny. so you're I'm hungry. so hungry. But yeah, Jack Ryder is saying, "Hey, we need that helmet of fate to, and this is to reverse what's happened to the outsiders. Uh-huh. This is to reverse that." That's what he wants it for. So it's actually quite a noble reason. Um, but when he's asking for this, he turns into the creeper to try and demand it. And Lady Cop pulls out her gun and... Not on my watch. Yeah, fires some <laughs> shots off. Yep. Creeper's down on the floor, bleeding out. And we cut to outside where Warlord's with Nonfat. And they're actually outside her house and they hear the gunshots and he's like, okay, I'm going to go in and see what that was. And it turns out they were waiting till late at night to try and steal the helmet of fate because they wanted to try and resurrect uh, uh, the, the kid that died. I forget his name. But is it bana- no, bananas. There's bananas, non-fat. 
The grapes. Is, it, is it good looks? Was good looks the one that died? I think it was good looks. Yeah. Uh, so they wanted to resurrect him, but Orion also wants to help them resurrect him because the spirit of Atlas is needed to stop the coming apocalypse, which is what High Father and and Dark Side are uh, trying to stop. struggling to stop and uh, up in the you know apocalypse mm-hmm. or wherever they are. So. Like, all these stakes are all coming together and they all revolve around the same object and all these characters are finally starting to communicate because after Warlord comes in and Lady Cop immediately shoots him, so he's dying yep. on the floor, which, which is, all, this was almost a comedy of errors where I just started uh-huh. laughing at how much carnage there was in Lady Cop's kitchen. So Nonfa hears these shots and decides to come in. There's a great full-page spread of just all these body, like, you know, creepers lying there dying, warlords lying there dying, and Lady Cop's just sitting up at the side, just like in shock of what's happened. Meanwhile, Orion's sitting with the other kids and like is getting restless because he's just, he's assuming that this is all going to not work and that they're all going to die with the apocalypse. And Nonfa explains everything to Lady Cop that's happened in his own way, at least. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he explains that they're trying to resurrect the other kid with the helmet, so they need the helmet. And much to his surprise, she gets up and says, okay, let's go get the helmet. Although you're all a bunch of idiots, I don't have it in my house, it's police evidence, it's at the station, you morons. I'm still a good cop. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, this was all really just kind of funny. Uh, meanwhile, on the plane, uh, the Commodore's getting mad. Uh, the other, like, two of the outsiders are just cutting off the one guy's arms that keep growing back. And they're mm-hmm. using his diamond sword to do it. You know, the one that was formed out of the arm. Which is relevant because at the end of the issue, when they're trying to do the the thing with the the helmet to bring you know, to reverse everything that's happened, one of the indications at the end is a cliffhanger that it's working, is that that, ar- that, that sword becomes an arm again. Uh, mm-hmm. We see that. Um, and it implies that Warlord might be coming back to life, that... Uh, the, the kid might be because there's a great two page spread when they're getting ready to do this right before the yeah. end of the issue where they've lined up Creeper Warlord and the corpse of the kid who at this point is actually decomposed a bit which I thought was a great yeah. touch yep because it shows the time has passed like you know um yeah I wasn't ready for that looking dark ritual looking thing you know there at the end so there's something really funny about this just being in her kitchen to be honest mm-hmm. I was I was oh. uh for sure. Entertained by this. Starman's sure. there by that point. He's shown up to, to help with the other kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only other scene that's probably worth mentioning in between this is that Lady Cop, when she's getting the helmet and mm-hmm. the, uh, the the diamonds that came from the crime scene, uh, this other cop catches her and tries to stop her and she has to knock him out with the, the, the yeah. bag. So mm-hmm. there may be consequences for that. We'll see what that, that builds to. Uh, yeah. But it, it looks like it's working at the end because Starman's smiling and there's mm-hmm. this light sort of like beaming down on Warlord, and then you see that the sword's turned into an arm. So it's a really strong indication that something's working. Yeah. Uh, all good so, stuff. So what got me is right is you got High Father and Dark Side are both you know struggling with whatever's coming, and uh, High Father falls out, and Dark Side asks him, "Is the Fifth World coming?" And he says, "No, not is it, no, not yet," or along those lines. Yeah. Right. So is this? Are they trying to make the fifth world happen? Because, you know, Jack Kirby's fourth world, like... No, no, no. I I think the way I read this is that if the apocalypse happens, then the fifth world will replace the fourth world and their time will be done. And I think this was like a no, not all hope is lost kind of statement. And I think what the book is kind of building up to here is how it's all these misfits and kids that are going to end Mm -hmm. up saving the universe by you know, reversing what they're reversing. So I think these kids and the outside, well, not the outsiders. Oh yeah, the outsiders, sorry. The outsiders. Uh, the yeah. outsiders, are, they're going to end up working together. They're going to end up saving the day. I think what was interesting to me from a thematic point of view is this whole thing with the Commodore saying, oh, you're just a bunch of children. You're just children mm-hmm. everywhere. And it cuts to a planet in the issue where it seems like this apocalypse is already starting, where this other planet's mm-hmm. been destroyed. Um, yeah. What was the planet here? Uh, Eutritus, I think? Eutritus, yeah. Um, and 
it intentionally starts the panel you see on the planet is a as a playground right and i thought that was interesting that this force is coming and killing everything and we see it from the perspective of a playground because the backstory to these characters both the outsiders and the green team was that some force some character showed up to the playground and changed the world and uh-huh. this idea that we're starting this world being destroyed with the playground i think thematically is linked between those two and I think the idea that it's all these characters from a playground that are inevitably going to like save the day and stop all this is very interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, from a because the whole thing the Commodore's yelling is that no, like I'm a winner and you're all losers. Like the winners are the ones who played the game correctly, and then the losers are everyone else. But it's all the misfits and losers who are going to actually save the world. And this little shit's right. not going to be the one who does that. He's not actually the important one. And I think right. that's kind of some of the stuff that the book's playing with here. At least that's what I was getting from this issue. Yeah, no, that's what I was getting from Tom King is it feels like he's like, look, all these kids seem like they might not have it together, but they, these kids are the future. They are the ones that if we give them the right tools, we'll eventually save everybody. Um, and part of that is recognizing that we have to hand it over to kids at a certain point, right? So that's why I look at Lady Cop and how like, when we see, like, Asia, we know she doesn't like to be called Lady Cop. She's not going to wait for, you know, she doesn't trust these heroes, right? But who does she trust? And it's all these misfit kids, right? And, and even like, then, she hasn't been throughout the book. This is a turning point, because all books, yeah. she's been like, oh, don't drive the AV, don't do this, right. don't do that. And that's why non fat surprised when she just says, mm-hmm. yeah, okay, yeah. I'll go get you the helmet, and we can do this. She's, right. she's trusting them. That's what you say. Like, eventually, they have to hand it mm-hmm. over to the, this new generation right. who may actually save everything. Right. I'm looking at this thing to see if this is a Tom King original or a Jack Kirby, the Eutritus. Oh, the planet? And if it has, it, yeah, if it, it has it, any it feels like something that could easily be pulled from an old comic. <laughs> yeah. But, no, I, I really like this. I, I really thought we'd get the end here and, like, the last issue would be like a, a Denoa, you know, epilogue kind of, you know, thing. It doesn't seem like that's where it's going to go because I don't, I don't see it resolving up in the beginning and then a skinny. I mean, I like think a... there'll be a part of it will be an epilogue, but yeah, like the final yeah. moment, the final part of the story is definitely still coming here. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, having the and it makes me wonder, like, is the kid when he's resurrected and the spirit of uh, or the energy of uh, Atlas is in him? Like, is he going to have to do something once he's alive because he's now tied uh, yeah. to that? That's that's what I'm wondering. Like, is he going yeah. to is he going to have to like sacrifice himself to save the, the universe, even though he's came back from the dead or something? I don't know. Like, I could see them pulling something like that. Well, yeah, because there's there's something too with Orion there that that he's like, well, no, we need like the soul or the spirit of Atlas, right? And that's what's holding up the Earth. It's not Atlas himself, right? But it's this it's this force that's also moved on. So so yeah, I wonder if yeah, that's what it's gonna be too. Cause someone says, why don't we resurrect Atlas as well? And he's like, Oh, that yeah. doesn't matter because the spirit's now in the kid. So right. very interested to see uh like because wh- I feel like you know, talking about the meaning of the book and the themes and all that has been one of the most interesting things about mm-hmm. it. Uh, obviously the craft and the page to page comic telling is fantastic in the way it yeah. it does the nuances, but I, I can't wait for the ending just to sort of have a more like unified like okay here we can look at the whole story now we can we can talk about what it's been yeah. saying about these characters and about the world and um you know it's funny we have a group here called the outsiders when kind of the entire book is full of outsiders like you know in terms yeah. of like they're, they're all misfits they're all like d-list characters mm-hmm. or c-list characters or beyond even yeah. and it's just yeah making them like ultimately be the important ones and like that being a statement for the world's quite interesting it's quite a poignant story potentially so uh it's been fantastic this was another great issue it feels like everything's coming together now and i'm just excited to see how it wraps up yeah me too yeah all right i'll be ready to rate okay uh, issue yeah. 11 of danger street what you what you giving it uh, i'm gonna give this a because the art was really good too we didn't really talk too much about foreigners and i know you want to eat so <laughs> i'll say the art was strong and for that too i'll give this a nine yeah no it's a nine out of ten for me as well it's yeah. fantastic uh you know obviously it's had one or two standout issues that have went even above this but this is a mm-hmm. another fantastic issue it's kind of par yep. for the course now with this with this book at this point so all right that'll take us out of the final part of the show where we pick our favorite stuff for the week for it panel slash moment favorite cover favorite art and of course top five books 
So what is your panel slash moment of the week, Matt? Um, I really did like that Gordon one in Detective Comics. I thought that was really good with Selena, with him yelling like a maniac. Um, but I'm going to give it to Teen Titans and, and Dick's decision at the end. Sure. I think that was really big, meaningful, and a big character moment. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm actually going with that page from Detective, but not so much the streaming. Mm-hmm. I'm going f- a mm-hmm. further bit down where she says, you know that he would break every rule to save you. He would stop mm-hmm. at no you know, no cost. Uh, and then like him and Silhouette reacting to that line of being like, she's right, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I, I just thought that was a really powerful moment that made a lot of sense. It was, it was like the best justification she could whip out for yeah. Gordon to like get on board with everything they were doing. So, yeah, very good. Uh, and she's right and that's the, that's why mm-hmm. it works so uh all right uh cover of the week i was looking a little bit at them le- earlier there's a great christian mm-hmm. word detective cover uh which is really cool uh, outsiders has another christian word cover which is also cool but honestly I, I think overall i don't usually say this but i think green lantern has like four fantastic covers it's oh. it's got a federici cover it's got a diodoto jr cover it's got a Doc Shainer cover, and then the regular covers are Manico, and they're all varying degrees of great to, to excellent. I think I'm probably going to give it to the regular cover overall. I think it's my favorite of the week. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a Manico one, but they're all great. So take your pick, really. Uh, what, what are you going with? <laughs> right. Uh, so those are some good shouts. Um, I didn't see the Shainer one till now. But mine is uh, Daniel Warren Johnson has a Sandman cover and it's all bathed in shadows in this church with Sandman at the center with this big stained glass window behind it. It's just, I wish I'd seen this cover in the shop because I would have picked it up. Sure. Uh, But that one's going to be mine. Yeah, great. Uh, All right. Best uh, art of the week. Uh, What you got? Usually I would go Fornes, right? Fornes is really good. Danger Street art was fantastic. He's won it a lot with those Danger Street issues. But Jason Alexander, like that art, the way that it shifts through Detective Comics, and then even we're going to add the backup in there. I was really a big fan of that Wingard art, so I'm going to give it to Detective this week. Oh, very nice. Yeah, I, I, very surprising. I, I'm almost tempted to agree with you and say Jason Alexander. Also, shout out to Zermanico for Green Lantern. I thought that mm-hmm. was fantastic. Uh, some other solid art throughout. Uh, Carrie's not quite in the same level as those as the three wins we're talking about, but I was mm-hmm. really impressed with Outsiders. I thought it was solid. Yep. Uh, but I'm also going to go with Alexander. And I think part of that is because I know that I can still give it to Fornes for Danger Street 12 next month uh-huh. <laughs> when the time comes. So. Well, and I also want to put out shouts to Lupacino, but that's just, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah Lupacino uh, was, was great as well. Lupacino, yeah. it's, it, you know, solid, solid, solid classic stuff. So. All right, top five books, Matt, go. All right, one's going to be Danger Street. Two is going to be Tech, three World's Finest, four Green Lantern, and five... Actually, let me redo that. Um, okay. One Danger Street, two Vigil, three Detective Comics, uh... four Green Lantern, five World's Finest Titans. Okay, uh, my number one is going to be Danger Street. My number two is Detective Comics. My number three is Vigil. My number four is Green Lantern. And my number five is... Yeah, probably World's Finest Teen Titans. Well, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, pr- yeah. I don't think Outsiders was quite there to get on my top five. But that said, it's yeah. only because it's a busy week. I think if it was a quieter week, Outsiders would have had a fair shot. For sure. Um, but, yeah. So, no. Very, very, very strong week. A couple of books I wasn't as keen on. I mean, Speed Force was just a complete whiff. But mm-hmm. still a lot of great stuff, you know, uh, this week. But I'll tell you what's coming next week from DC Comics. So let's see how busy next week is. We have Nightwing 108. We have World's Finest Superman Batman. We have Superman issue 8. We have Titans issue 5. Wonder Woman issue 3. Justice Society of America issue 7. We have Catwoman 59. Justice League vs. Godzilla vs. Kong issue 2. Green Lantern War Journal issue 3. Jay Garrick The Flash issue 2. Hot Girl issue 5. Batman Off World issue 1. So that's Jason Aaron's new series. And then there's also Harley Quinn, Black, White, and Red are issue five, and Titans, Beast World, Evolution, issue one. Uh, is that uh, something that we have to do for the event? Or is that a reprint thing? I'm looking... Uh, it's, I think it's, it's, a, it's a reprint. It's a reprint. Yeah, okay. Yeah, they're, they're yeah. Beast Wars are good, good. I saw an $8 big book there, yeah. and I was like, oh, if I don't have to read this... Yeah, well, it's right, already a good. big list of books even before yeah. we got to that, yeah. 
but yeah, I mean, I had already dropped Hot Girl, so I don't have to worry about that. So that's nice. Yeah. So yeah, but even then, still another healthy week of books. I've got what? I have nine. No, I think I've got ten, including Off World. Two, three, four. Yeah, I've got ten. A lot of books. I'm, I'm counting mine. Because <laughs> I got to get caught up on Godzilla and Kong. Yeah, it's, so, uh, yeah. If you get caught up in Godzilla and Kong, it'll be the same yeah. for you. I think. I don't think there's yeah. anything that I'm reading that you're not. Nope. So. Uh, but yeah. I, I'm, I'm excited for a lot of these I'm always excited for Nightwing I'm mm-hmm. pumped for Wonder Woman because that's been fantastic JSA has been been great uh, and obviously War Journal has been one of my new favourites so yeah I'm excited for a lot of these mm-hmm. so very good uh, but that'll do the show so uh, thank you very much for joining us you can of course let us know what you thought of the books in the comments and please do hit the like button if you're watching on YouTube because it helps more people find the show if you listen to the audio version rate the show 5 stars on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast from Helps us out a bunch, and of course you can support all the content over at patreon.com slash TV. Get the show a little bit early and just help keep it coming, help keep the lights on, help keep the books paid for, all that stuff. But that is us. Thank you very much for joining us. I am going to go stuff my face with as much food as I can possibly muster, because I am starving. Sounds like a good idea. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you next time. Keep reading DC Comics, and remember to never get lost in the Speed Force.